Hello, everyone. I think we'll uh, get this going. Um, I, was, I don't know if Andrea provided it. I'm assuming she did. I sent out a little bio of who I am. I think a lot of people in this room don't have a clue. Uh, some of you I've known for years, some of you I don't know at all or haven't met yet. So uh, I just wanted to kind of give a little introduction before we start this thing up. That I'm Norm Pillen, and I'm uh, presently president of Seafood Producers Cooperative based out of Sitka. I've been a longline fisherman for over 40 years now, and uh, also trolled and participated in some other fisheries. Have a have a tender currently. Um, um, I wanted to preface this meeting just uh, saying it's it's an honor to uh, be here, and um, it's very significant to me in a couple of ways of this 100th anniversary of the commission. Um, it's certainly worth recognizing the, the history of this organization. And um, it's significant, our, our SBC started as a halibut producers co-op in 1944. We'll be celebrating our 80th year as a, as a co-op this year. So um, a lot of history in this fishery. And uh, it supported a, supported a lot of fishermen, a lot of families, a lot of business through the years. And uh, I appreciate all of us getting together and helping to uh, preserve that resource. Thank you. Okay. And um, let's, uh, the next thing on the agenda, first thing on the agenda is the accreditation. So um, can we share that on the board. Yeah, so if we could just have the Secretariat staff pull up the accreditation PowerPoint. All right, so on the screen you will see the presentation uh, of the accreditation. Uh, so just for the terms of a reference, uh, we did have a change in the rules of procedures. And so members of the PAB are buyers who process and or custom process Pacific halibut caught in the convention area, including associations with at least one member that meets that criteria. So through the accreditation process uh, we went through this year, um, uh, we had all interested parties fill out the accreditation form via the IPHC website. The Secretariat then reviewed those accreditation forms um, and they verified the business. So we did that by verifying the business license and the website. Um, if it was not very clear that uh, you could purchase or process the uh, processor was purchasing and processing Pacific Halibut, we did make a phone call to verify. For associations, we uh, looked at the membership. We asked them to provide their membership and verified that membership, and then also looked at their 990 tax filing. The secretary had also contacted all individuals who registered for attendance for the PAB uh, today, uh, who were satisfied, uh, who would have satisfied eligibility, um, and made sure that they, if they wanted to, they could accredit and go through the process as well. So we do have some new members here uh, today through the accreditation process. And so uh, Wind and Tide doing business as Peninsula Seafoods. Jeff Granham is the voting member uh, with Dustin Phillips also attending. We also have Alaska Fish Factory and that's Jeff Chonsky. Oh, how do you say that again? Hohenski, oh, all right, thank, thank you. From Canada, we have Aero Trading Company and we have Liam Stockwell. And then for associations accrediting, we have the Halibut Association of North America, Hannah, Peggy Parker. And we have the Pacific Seafood Processors Association, Nicole Kimball. This is not part of the accreditation, but also just uh, for your awareness, we do have a change in voting member with Dana Bessaker. Uh, Susan Adair will be the voting member for Dana Bessaker. And with that, we will need to validate the accreditation. Uh, Peggy's got a question. Go ahead, Peggy. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, to validate the accreditation is to approve the secretariat's process. Is that correct? It's to approve the members that have been uh, accredited via the uh, rules of procedures. Yeah. So in the past, the way the PAB has approved new members is to make a motion to approve a new member, discuss that individual who's applied to join, and then take a vote on it individually. So is that what we're, we will do after we um, do this? I'm not really sure what we're being asked to do right now. The oh, sorry about that. The vote is to uh, accredit the, the process and the, and the members uh, that we've gone through and made sure that they have been accredited or they are accredited per the rules and procedures. They've met that accreditation. So, I mean, you guys can have a, a conversation a, about it if you would like, but uh, they have met the accreditation and should be accredited. So am I confused, Chair, or, or um, I'd like it clear in everyone's mind what accreditation means. And my understanding of what accreditation was, was the registration process to be accepted to join the group through the secretariat, but that there was a separate approval process by the PAB to just vote on whether or not they would accept the company or the individual or the association. So um, the reason I'm asking this twice is because it shifts for us to accredit these applicants is putting the decision on whether they should be members with the secretariat and not with the PAB. And I don't know that everyone quite understands that that's what we're doing here. That is correct. That's a change from the past way that the PAB has operated. I don't have a lot of longevity, but I've been here a couple of years and this is different mechanism than what we've used before. So I guess the, we would probably like to hear from some other people about uh, how they would choose to go forward from this if it's something different than um, what Secretariat has proposed here. John? So I'm trying to understand the, the recent history here. I, I know what the PAB has done in the past, but I think what's happened is there was a group formed last fall, after, no, no, after last year's meeting, um, that was looking at, and I believe the group was was PAB members. Am, am I wrong about that? So there was a group formed. Um, they made some recommendations, but my understanding is the recommendations. W one of the recommendations was this this uh, history of we've uh, as a group we've uh, sort of done our own accreditation, uh, but now that's been taken out of our hands. I don't think that that was part of what the group's recommendation was. Am I correct in that? Yeah, so so this, and I don't know who was on the group. I know I wasn't, um, but um, so my, <laughs> I guess what we find ourselves here is at loggerheads because the commission, the secretariat rather, is telling us that we, they get to approve and in the past we've approved. So it seems like our opportunity as a group is to say, hey, we want it this way. And um, realizing that that might go counter to what um, the secretariat says. And Mike, is that, is that where we are? That's where we're at. Um, you know, we, I was part of that work group and what came back from the secretariat was a lot different than what the working group had put forward. So if, the, if this group, the PAG, wants to revisit that and make a different decision, um, you know, it was raised to me in a conversation the other day is um, what would happen if the secretariat was trying to decide who got to represent them on the uh, conference board? And... Um, it, it wouldn't go over very well. This is a smaller group, uh, but it's important. 
and um, we want to operate it in the best manner possible for people to feel like rep representation is where we want it to be. So, okay, go ahead, John. So, um, I just say two things relative to what you said. First of all, this is a rather large group compared to many of the PAB, PAG at, the, at that time, it's called the PAG, the, the meetings we had. I remember meeting with five people and three of them were from the company I work for, including myself. So um, we've come a long way looking at all this crowd. Um, second is I, I, I remember when the conference board used to be about 20 voting members. And then there was a spell where uh, CDQ groups I think it was those that group got to be part of the process, and suddenly the conference board expanded to, you know, eighty people, and there was a process of of going through and sort of deciding who got to vote there. And I think that was completely done by the conference board people. Alverson, Bob Alverson, was the chair of the conference board at the time. So if we're gonna, if history's any guide, uh, seems like seems like this group should be the one that makes the decision. That's my two bits. Um, so just a, a point of a clarification. The Secretariat is the commission. It is uh, very clear of what the commissioners have, have come through. And so there is not a divide between um, the commission and the, and the Secretariat. Um, the accreditation process, um, I believe in, our, in the Secretariat and the commission's minds is a procedural process. It is, uh, they meet, uh, these businesses and these associations meet the proper accreditation and therefore uh, should, be, should be accredited per the rules of procedures. So Andrew, sorry to push this so much, but do you know, do the, so all those groups in the, in the conference board, have they been done, have they had a similar kind of event in terms of accreditation? Uh, so the conference board and the processes or advisory board are completely separate sub, uh, subsidiary bodies, and I uh, don't have a history with the, the conference board. Um, I have a history with you guys, um, and so this is this is what I know. But I do know that it's a little bit there are nuances, and it is a bit different. Bruce, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I guess I'm not too hung up about the accreditation thing. We but you know the the commissioners decided that we had put to maybe narrow parameters on but the process was strange they asked us to talk about accreditation we had a breakout group i think it was piggy and norm and carl and heather and me and jesse and we were all on there we all spent quite a bit of time on it and we kind of agonized over too many details and we came up with a re recommendation and, and the whole thing kind of got flushed and that's I mean, on this particular issue, I'm personally not all that upset about it, but it's, it's a strange precedent. If we're PAB and they ask us to make decisions and we make decisions, come forward with recommendations, put some time into it, and they completely come out and completely ignore it and won't even give us much feedback on why they ignored it or anything, the process was flawed for sure. And if we're going to talk about stuff that's going to affect the economics of our companies or the processing advisory board issues that are important. Are we part of a process or are we all just sitting here having a hoo-ha and it goes off and does whatever they want? That, that's, that's the disturbing part of the whole thing to me. All right. Thank you, Bruce. And I, you know, I, I think that the secretariat's approach to this, if I was interpreting it right, was, that they had some concerns about limiting access and, you know, getting participation in this um, group and shutting the door to uh, potential participants. I sort of disagree with that approach in the fact that, you know, there's, there's might be people that want to come in here and have input and voting power that, um, we might not want, and that this this or you know this group was put together to represent you know direct buyers of halibut processors, and that's that's what it should consist of. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thanks. 
Carl just reminded me real quick that we're going to have the commissioners come in and you know, a couple of them and speak to this also at 345. Yeah. Okay. Peggy. I just want to make one comment um, from what Andrea said, follow up on it. Um, my understanding from since 2005 being a member of this group was that the secretariat was not the commission in one maybe small way. And that was that the advisory bodies were beholden to the commissioners, not the secretariat. So that when we submitted something for change to our tour or for change to any aspect of this group, it was directly to the commissioners and the commissioners directly to us would either approve or not approve what we were doing. And what happened last year was you know, the opposite of that. So that's, I think, one of the reasons why you're hearing all this. Uh, I just want to read out, um, there's a comment here from Nick uh, Harris. Uh, what if we put a motion to accept the new members into the PAB and also note that the PAB disapproves of the procedure that seems forced from us the secretariat. It seems like a motion word above would resolve two of our two outstanding issues, accepting these new members, which I think we all would approve and make note it should be done at the PAB and not at the secretariat that accepts the membership. Mr. Woodruff. Well, I would uh, make that motion. It, it, did, did Nick make the motion or did he suggest the motion? I think he said am I, am the I wording of it is what what if we put a motion forward Pardon and me? It, he just wrote right now I'll make the motion okay could you read the motion please to accept the new members into the PAB and also note that the PAB disapproves of the procedure that seemed forced from the secretariat so I'll second Okay, we have a motion and a second discussion. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It seems to me that we maybe should bifurcate that motion. And I don't know if an amendment is in order, but it seems like two separate things would be good with the friendly, friendly amendment. <laughs> that, okay. I mean, it's two quite different things, and there might be people who agree with one but not the other. Is my point, you know? Um, so we should reach out to the motion maker and see if he's if he would accept a friendly accept amendment a friendly amendment to have two separate motions, <clears throat> so that people don't have to, you know, accept or not accept both at the same time. Nick, you should have mic access now. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear you? Okay, sorry, is that the way that we get on the mic by putting the hand up and then we get called on? Is that, that's the process? We'll leave the access on so you can talk. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I can make a friendly, uh, I can live with the friendly amendment to the motion. That's fine.
So we have a motion to accept the members, the new members. Bruce? Second. Question? Any opposed? Okay, can we uh, maybe have a restructure of the second motion? Mr. Go ahead, Heather. Mr. Chairman, do you want the maker of the motion to do that? That would be preferred. I'll wordsmith something right now and I'll type it into the, uh, the, the chat box. So give me two minutes to wordsmith it. Okay, thank you. Um, do we need a motion to accept the rest of the uh, members? Have there already been accredited that we should be good to go? Yeah, existing members. Okay, thanks. Jesse, I see you're commenting on there. I'm a long ways away from the screen, but I can see it up there. So I think the speaker's turned on, so um, I can hopefully I can get somebody to pay attention to who's got their hand up so we can call you out. Okay, Carl's going to help. Oh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we got gotcha. you. Great. Actually, I just, um, I was sent a note from Monica about how we were supposed to vote, but then when I tried to get on to vote, it's not connecting. So I'm just, we didn't really go over that at the start of the meeting. Like how are the virtual members supposed to vote? Uh, hi, Jesse. Um, yeah, so this is Monica. So uh, we had planned to do it just after the accreditation, just to make sure that nobody that was not accredited ended up being able to vote. So we haven't, I'll give a presentation after these first couple of votes, I suppose. So I think for the first um, couple of votes, if there's anybody opposed online, make sure that we see your hand, if that works. That would be fine. Okay, so if we approve, just uh, sit still. And then if we oppose, raise our hand or make a ruckus. Make a ruckus. <laughs> Yeah, I'll read Nick's uh, motion B here. The PAB notes that it does not agree with the process implemented by the Secretariat on accreditation. The PAB wishes to retain an autonomy on which parties are allowed into the PAB. Yes, thank you, Heather. Discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. It's a fun way to start out a meeting pretty controversial topic <laughs> but uh glad we got through it we can get on with our agenda thank you everyone mr chairman yes heather thanks i, I want to apologize for being late and i also wonder if you've already approved the agenda 
Sorry. We have we have not. We were just getting through the accreditation. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. So staff's gonna, we're gonna have a different voting process this time than normal. We're going electronic, I guess. And so we're gonna have a little quick update from Monica on how we do that process. For the people in the room um, to try to expedite this, um, because I don't know everybody's faces. I'm gonna go as fast as I can. So I'm just gonna need a minute to pass things out before I can start. Um, so please bear with me. Um, I also had to make up acronyms because I don't know everybody's acronyms. Um, so I'm sorry, uh, but I will do my best to pass these out quickly. Maybe it's good bathroom break or something. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. I don't normally have to talk much, so thank you. I'd also just like to make note that there's a sign-in sheet being passed around if everyone can make sure to fill it out today and tomorrow. Thank you. I guess one question for Monica is people online, how will they vote? Um, I will explain all of that. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes. Did you see Kit Janelle's comment on there? He's wondering if there's a way he can know who's in the room. That's a good question. I don't know. Kit would like to know if there's a way to see who's in the room. We're not, we don't have any video feed, I don't think. Could we pass a sign in sheet, like take a picture of the sign in sheet and put it up, something like that? Yeah. yeah. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, could we just introduce ourselves as well? That's a great yeah, great idea. We'll go around the table. Thanks. My name is uh, Nicole Kimball, and I'm Vice President of Pacific Seafood Processors Association here in Anchorage. Um, the majority of our members are direct buyers of halibut across Alaska. Thank you, Nicole. Peggy Parker. I'm the Executive Director of the Halibut Association of North America. Uh, we represent also direct buyers of halibut in Alaska, Washington, British Columbia, Oregon, and California. Thanks, Peggy. Susan Adair, Dana Busker Company. Thanks, Susan. Mark Callahan, the John Nagel Company. It's Mark. Bill Sullivan, Catchman Bay Seafoods. Thanks, Bill. Jeff Owinski, Alaskan Fish Factory. Thank you, Jeff. Heather McCarty, um, 170 Degrees North, uh, subsidiary of Central Bering Sea Fishermen's Association in Area 4. Thanks, Heather. Carl Nordman, SM Products. Thanks, Carl. I'm Norm Pillen, Chairman. I'm Andrea Kaikola, Assistant Director of the International Pacific Halibut Commission. I'm Monica Tom, uh, Port Operations Coordinator at the Pacific Halibut Commission. Thank you. I'm Jeff Granham, Peninsula Seafoods. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, John Woodruff, OBI Seafoods. Hey, John. Bob, Bob from many FAS Seafoods from Canada. Bob. Liam Stockwell, Aero Trading. Yeah, Canada. thanks. Bruce Hale, FAS Seafoods. Thanks, Bruce. Steve Bessick, Pacific Seafood. Steve. <clears throat> David Brindle, Pacific Seafoods. Thank you, David. 
That's everyone. Did you get all that kit? And who's online? <clears throat> yeah, can we, but maybe we can get the. I don't know if the people that are online can see the other folks that are online. I think they can, but uh, if the folks online want to try to introduce themselves, if they can get the audio to work. Sure. Hey guys, it's Nick here at Seven Seas Fish Company. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. It's Jesse Keplinger with Alaska Glacier Seafoods. Thanks, Jess. Okay, so for those online, uh, you should have received an email uh, not too long ago about how to sign in. At this point, you should be able to sign in. So please, please go ahead and try. Um, and I will, I think I'm now ready to give a presentation on how this all works. So um, it's very simple. So hopefully um, it works out. So could I please have the secretary pull up? Oh, there it is. Okay. So, um, so you each, everybody who is a voting member and now accredited um, for the PAB should have one voting clicker. Um, if you're a proxy for someone else today, you should have two. Um, and again, for those online, I sent you an email. So um, please work through that link and let me know if you have any problems. Um, so your clicker is labeled with your organization's name um, and the country you're affiliated with um, on the side of it. And that's exactly how you should appear on the screen once the voting um, occurs. Um, and you'll see how, what that looks like in just a minute. Um, it should be ordered alphabetically by organization acronym. Um, so if you're having a hard time finding yourself, uh, please send your ABCs. Um, there's not too many of you here, so hopefully it's easy. Um, it's important for you to see yourself on the screen just to make sure your vote went through because um, you can see whether or not it went through in real time. Um, you can change your vote as many times as you want while the vote is open, but while it's closed, when it closes, the, your last vote is the vote that counts. So if you accidentally push yes, just push no. Um, and the last thing you push is what it will record. Um, the letter displayed for those people in person on your screen indicates the vote you received. Um, so that little tiny square on your clicker should say A, B, or C, A for yes, B for no, C for abstain. Um, once your name on the screen has turned from gray to blue, that means your vote has been received. Once the vote closes, it will change to green, red, or yellow. Um, so green for yes red for no and yellow for abstain. Um, and the chair will call to close the vote and I will close the vote electronically. Um, so ensure that after it closes that your letter on your screen is the vote you wanted to count. Um, when the votes close, we appreciate your patience while the IPHC secretary of staff, i.e. myself, takes a few minutes to validate the voting results Make sure everything is counted properly before we display the results on the screen for all of you to see. Um, the voting clickers should not leave the meeting room. Um, so please, please, please try to leave them here. Um, at the end of the day, just leave them on, on the table um, for tomorrow. Um, and that's pretty much it for everybody in person. Online. Um, so again, you should have received an email. Make sure that you enter your information exactly how it was sent to you. Even an extra space or a not space um, will not allow you to be a registered voter in the system. Um, so you'd have to try again. Um, it might let you sign in, but it won't let you vote. So just be careful. So again, when we're doing this test, make sure your vote goes through. And if it doesn't, please let me know. Um, I can't approve the voting status of anyone uh, trying to enter without proper credentials. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, online voters will appear at the end of the list on the voting grid and you'll have a red or green line next to your, your organization acronym. If the line's red, please just refresh your browser and, and it should be green. If it's green, your 
moving along in real time with us. It, in general, you'll have to refresh your screen for every vote because there's going to be time between and it'll be inactive. Um, so now I'm going to open up a test vote. So everybody just get ready. Again, yes uh, is green, no is red, and yellow is abstain. Um, so for those online, I just turned on my microphone. At the top of the screen, you'll see the motion. Um, if the motion is very, very long, you'll at least see the motion number and you sh we should be able to know what we're voting on before we open it up. Um, but at least a short description will be there. Now I've opened the vote, you'll see the vote is open. Uh, some of you have already figured out how to push buttons, so you're doing a good job. Um, so you can see the people starting to highlight in blue from from the gray color, those people have voted. It looks like Kit has figured it out online and so has Tyler. Um, and we'll just make sure that everyone online um, gets in and that the people in the, in the room as well can push buttons before we move forward. Okay, so I'm just going to confirm. Okay, uh, somebody's going to confirm that Casey is not having trouble getting into Adobe because right now he's not online, and I, I don't think that. Uh, James is here from Taku or Huna Cold Storage. And if someone else has a different answer than that, I will remove him from the, the list. Okay. So I'll remove James and then um, I think we're good to go. Um, I can fix up Casey if he needs. So if everybody's okay, then I'll close this test vote. Feeling okay? Okay, thank you, um, everyone except for Bruce. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so to be clear, these won't let us click into ESPN, right? But you're all ready to be on the House of Representatives now because this is the voting system that they do use. Thank you. So if I could have the IPHC Secretariat um, pull up the just the title slide for the panel, please. Yeah, Peggy. Just a quick question. Are we obligated to use this um, um, process for the folks that are here? Or uh, is it something that is at the discretion of the chair you are obligated to use the voting system yes i think uh using two different methods in the same vote even though this is challenging that might get more confusing thanks peggy so if you are all okay, we can skip the part where I do some Excel work and then re and, and give you the totals for this presentation. And you guys can go ahead and move forward. Okay, thank you. Right, thank you. Can we pull up the agenda, please. Mr. Chairman. 
Um, yeah, go ahead, um, Heather. I know it's probably me, but I'm trying to connect to the electronic version here so that I can see it on my screen. I see that others have it. How? I, I just, I can't get it. It says it's already over when I click on trying to register. So maybe, is there, is it still available so that we can get on? You've, you're on. Yeah, join as a guest. Oh, okay. I couldn't do a registry. But just join as a guest. Okay, thank you. Okay, that was my question. Thank you. Yes, go ahead, John. Move we approve the agenda as, as presented. Thank you. Going to get a second. Discussion? Carl? I just want to add and note that the commissioners are coming to the agenda. Great. Heather? Yeah, um, I see that there is um, a section under three where um, Ray Webster's, well, I can't actually see that. That's my eyes, but I think he's, it's the same as <laughs> the one I looked at. He's coming to talk about the FIS. Correct. 2024. Um, it says it's an informational session. Is there an opportunity there to make motions regarding um, any of those items uh, during that portion of the agenda? If the group would like to have that opportunity. Okay, yes. I, did, I was just wondering if, if there was, because if not, I would like to suggest that that be added to the agenda as a discussion item and potential action item comments from the this body to the commissioners on any of those topics actually yes i think that'd be fine during that agenda yes okay thank you very much and i have one more thing mr chairman go ahead um i'd like to give a short uh, update on the a halibut abm bycatch um, management um action as an agenda addition? Uh, if, if necessary. If not, if you can just call on me to do it at some point at your discretion, that's fine. But I would like to make an actual presentation of five minutes or so just to update everybody on that particular action. I think we would probably all like to hear that. Okay. So anytime is fine with me. Thank okay. You. Is there any but he opposed to the agenda as it stands. Agenda is approved. So the next item is the mortality limit, Dr. Stewart's presentation. And we're waiting for him. We called him, yeah, okay, thanks. Well, it might be a minute to, for him to get here. Maybe this might be the best time for uh, you to put your uh, presentation out there, if everybody's amenable to that. Okay, thank you. I don't have a PowerPoint or anything, but um, and some of you may know this already. I'm thinking that the people that aren't, you know, conversant with the council stuff and with NIMS, perhaps the Canadians may not. So that's why I thought it might be good to just give a little bit of an update. So one of the main concerns of all of us through the years, especially I think Canada, has been the level of bycatch of halibut in the US groundfish fisheries. And we've talked about this many times at this body and um, we've updated you on what the council is trying to do about that issue uh, several times. And so, as you know, in 2015, the council passed um, an action that reduced bycatch in all of the groundfish fisheries um, substantially. I think a combined average reduction of 23 point something percent. And at that time, the council indicated that that was just the beginning of what they hoped to do to better manage um, halibut bycatch. And there are people in this room who were on the council at that time. <laughs> <laughs> and who said, this is just the beginning. And But going forward, what we'd like to consider is abundance-based management of halibut bycatch 
In other words, make the bycatch numbers, the bycatch limits, um, based on the abundance of halibut annually. And so it wasn't just a static cap or limit on bycatch. It was going to go up and down with halibut abundance. And everybody thought that was a good idea. And so um, the next year, in 2016, we initiated an action to um, do just that to manage halibut bycatch in the ground fish fisheries based on halibut abundance. And this was just for the Bering Sea. Um, the council didn't want to do the Bering Sea and the Gulf at the same time. So they decided to start with the Bering Sea. So they did. And um, eventually um, a motion was made that linked the limits for halibut bycatch in the Bering Sea to the abundance of halibut in the Bering Sea. And the two indices that were used, and this was a long process to determine this, but the, the two indices that ended up being used to determine abundance was, number one, the trawl survey in the Bering Sea done by NIMS annually. And the second index was the set line survey done by the IPHC. And so those two ind indices in a certain combination, high, low, medium, and high, low, um, in a kind of a grid, if you will, in a table, are used now to determine the halibut abundance for any given year. And so that, after much work and angst, passed the council in December of 2021. And in December of 2023, um, the final rule was published and to implement that action by the council. The state of Alaska made the motion. And one of the key things that happened during that whole process was that the state of Alaska removed, well, the council removed from the action, everybody except Amendment 80. And so Amendment 80 is now the only sector, which is the bottom trawl sector, the only sector that is bound by this, this new regulation. And so we now have it in place for 2024. Um, and almost immediately, the uh, groundfish sector that was regulated, the Amendment 80 crowd, um, under the uh, name of the Groundfish Forum, which is their trade association, brought suit against the National Marine Fisheries Service to stop the implementation of the council action, management by litigation, essentially. And so um, now, <laughs> those of us who worked for 12 years on, on this um, are really forced to intervene on the side of the government, which we are in the process of doing. There are a number of interveners signed up in a, in a coalition to sort of represent the halibut stakeholders in the Bering Sea, including communities, tribes, processors, halibut fishermen, groups of halibut fishermen. Um, and in order to intervene on the side of the government, in other words, help the government win this case um, against the groundfish trawlers. So that's where we are right now. Um, we expect to hear um, initial arguments from the Groundfish Forum in uh, April, I understand. And uh, the IPHC is sort of intimately involved with this case um, because <laughs> one of the big contentions uh, made by the Groundfish Forum in their initial filing was that the IPHC really doesn't know how many halibut are in the Bering Sea. And so that index is faulty, the index, um, the set line survey uh, index. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that later when we talk about the FIS, but I just wanted to bring you all up to speed on that. Um, there's a great deal of disappointment in the halibut stakeholder camp um, about the uh, suit that has been filed. I'm happy to talk about it with anybody offline or take questions now if you want to or if you want to go to this, uh, Mr. Chairman. Well, I think that Dr. Stewart and Dr. Hicks being in the room, we probably should uh, move to the agenda, but I appreciate the update. I think everybody knows the importance of getting this trawl bycatch issue under control and, you know, that, that Bering Sea stock has long been determined to be in the nursery for pretty much the whole resource. So um, we're hopeful that we can make some progress there. Go ahead, Nicole. 
I just had one addition to that update, just so it's clear that the there's not an injunction at at this point that the that rule is in place. Um, so mm -hmm. it's not as if it's not in place for 2024. So it's proceeding as intended. Thank you. Thanks for the clarification. Okay, Dr. Stewart. Good afternoon. Um, were you expecting a presentation? Or would you like to just go have open questions and answers? Or how, how should we best? I it? think that all of us have probably been I've been through the presentation three times. I think most of us have probably been through it. I would open I would, I would just open it up to questions, comments. Mr. Woodruff. So if not a presentation, we were hoping you could just dance. <laughs> um, my question, um, Ian, is so the presentation this morning, there was a graph that showed the 12, the 2012 year class, and it showed 42% of it is uh, being counted in the fishery as of the 2023 uh, year. And then in 2026, it shows 80%. And if I if I look at what all the other information you provided, it seems to me that uh, we're hanging a lot on that 2012 year class. And we're also hanging a lot on that number 42% for 2023 and 80% for 2026. So my question for you is, and let me back up a little bit. What concerns me is if 42% is actually 68%, because we don't really know how much of that fish is part of the 2023 fishery. And I think the, the description of this is, it's, it's part of the uh, spawning biomass. It's 42% of, sp of that year class is part of spawning biomass, which is how we sort of measure everything. But my question is, how accurate do you think that is? Because if instead of 42%, it's 82%, and we have what we have, then the future doesn't look nearly as bright as it does at 42%. So that's my question. How confident are you that 42% is correct? Thanks for the question. This is one of the biggest uncertainties that we're facing right now. Um, we, have, we have historically, we've used the same maturity schedule for these fish for the last 20 years. And we've looked at it a few times and it appears to have held up over time. Even though we've seen such large changes in size at age, the maturity at age seems to be very consistent over time. And they actually noted this, uh, my predecessors at the commission noted this in the early 2000s, that even over that period from the 70s to the early 2000s, maturity at age had been relatively constant. The wrinkle is that we now have some better techniques to measure maturity. So all of those historical studies were based on visual assessment of the fish in the field. We now have what's called histological methods, where we can take a slice of the ovaries of these fish, put it under a slide, look at it under a microscope, and determine for sure whether that fish was mature or not. Um, we know that the visual techniques have some error associated with them. And so this is why we've prioritized this as our, our highest research priority, because one, it, it is a little surprising that the maturity schedule hasn't changed despite big changes in the biology of the fish. And two, we we're relying on this visual method which may be accurate and it may not be accurate and so i mean i can't i can't put a percentage on it but i would say this is a a serious point of uncertainty and it would be less so if we didn't just have a single year class that we were effectively counting on if we had multiple year classes this wouldn't be as as pointed a risk that said we're in a better shape this year with regard to the 2012 year class than we were last year in that at least they're one year older. But the next three years are gonna be the period when this is most critical, because as I showed this morning, we're going from less than half of them mature to almost all of them mature over the next three years. And as you point out, if we're, if we're actually behind on that, for example, if this year class matures more slowly than we expect, then the spawning biomass in the water over the next few years could be substantially less than what we think it is. 
so just to follow up, just the last comment you made, yeah, in the short term, it could be much less, but in the longer term, if that 42% is correct and they're spawning, they're, they're maturing more slowly, then, then further down the road, it's better. I don't, I'm not sure it's better or worse. Um, we would just, our, our fishing intensity calculations and reference points and things would adjust to whatever the best information we have is. Um, I think better would be being confident in the information that we do have. The one thing I will say, and the reason why we, we're not maybe flagging this as an even larger risk is because we don't have a strong relationship for Pacific halibut between the amount of spawning biomass and the recruitment that's produced. Uh, we've, we've seen some big recruitments come out of small spawning biomass levels before. And so that, what that means is that if we're a little bit behind on spawning biomass, it may not have a huge implication for recruitment in the near future. Um, but it certainly would be a, a, a bias in our, our evaluation of the stock relative to the reference points currently. I, I realize that's not a very, it's not a completely quantitative answer for you, but it's a, it's a challenging issue to, to quantify. Just to that point, like, do you know why there was like a large recruitment from a small spawning biomass in particular, or was it just like perfect oceanic? conditions that led to it perfect feed temperature or is it unknown that's, that's the magic question okay if we can okay. if we could predict if we if we understood the conditions and we could predict upcoming recruitment we'd be in great shape i just wasn't sure if you can look back historically and say okay you know this year class was came from this and from our research you know the ocean was so far, what? yeah. So far, the best we've been able to do is that it seems to be correlated on average to the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. So, if we have warm, productive conditions in the Gulf, that seems to be good for halibut, but it doesn't predict individual year classes. And I have no idea why the eighty-seven year class was twice as big as any other year class we've ever seen. We've looked at that year. We can't really make a correlation out of one data point because I'm sure we can find something that was unique about nineteen eighty-seven, but it's probably not why it's good for halibut. Peggy. Thanks. Um, I had a, a, I was a little confused on something that I'm not sure if you can answer or maybe um, Dr. <coughs> Webster could on the survey. It has to do with the captain stations. And if they are given, if they are allowed to choose within the block a third of their own stations based on what's going on with the boat, what's going on with the weather, all those conditions, has anyone calculated what the uncertainty would be in the stock assessment or in the raw material that you use for the stock assessment or um, done any runs, I guess, thinking about doing an MSE analysis of that, but maybe there's a faster way to do it, where you could somewhat predict how the skipper's decision making would impact the final results. Sorry, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take a stab at it and Ray may have some things to add as well. Um, I, the closest thing we have to a previous experiment like this was the densified grid that we did in uh, IPHC regulatory area 2A in I believe 2017 and 18, or possibly 16 and 17, where we added additional stations in between the grid stations. And what we found there was that although we, we collected useful data um, and it was we were able to use that in the modeling, it didn't have an, a huge effect on our results. And the reason why is because we're predicting the halibut abundance across the whole grid. And so having additional stations in between the grid cells doesn't inform a very big area. Now we're not gonna just take a, 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 a raw average of all stations because we know, well, we would hope that the skippers will do a little better on average than just fishing on grid stations. So we wouldn't just average those um, naively. We would account for the fact that these skipper stations are going to lie in between the grid cells. And so what our expectation is that we will get some additional information from these stations, but they won't. It's not as powerful as having them all spread out on the grid. This is, as Dr. Webster described it this morning, this is a, a, a temporary way to hopefully improve the catch rates a little bit to make the 
the uh, FIS slightly more financially viable, but we don't see this as a long-term solution, both because it could create some problems in the data over the long term, um, which chronically missing the, the, the lower catch rate stations and adding these additional stations, but also just because it's not a very efficient way to go in terms of d information content of the data. A quick follow-up. So what if there are anomalies in that new policy and you get big blank areas or, um, let me put it a different way, are there guardrails for the skippers to, um, I know they have a block, so that's a big guardrail, but are there any other guardrails where if they did that for 50% of the stations rather than 33%, it would be noted somehow? Or how is that really going to be monitored? Thanks. And, and you know, we've, we've just sorted some of these details out leading up to this meeting. But we, there are a couple of guardrails. One is that we're going to ask them not to set within the three nautical mile circle around the existing stations. Um, so we won't be refishing individual stations. We'll at least have them outside following our normal protocol. We don't want sets closer than three miles. Um, and then the second sideboard is, and it's a good one that you noted, they, they're they only allowed one skipper station per day. So, and they have to do at least two grid cell grid stations that day. So it could be the third station of the day, or it could be the fourth station of the day if they choose to do four, but they're not going to be allowed to do 50% of these stations. And we, we believe that because of that, and because of the running time, between the grid cells, it's unlikely we're going to end up with large holes in the design because they're still going to have to fish two stations close by. So we might we might have a case where we have four adjacent grid cells and they sort of come at it from all sides and, and skip those four, but we shouldn't have any more than four, I don't think, um, blanks in general across the design, which, you know, we, we have, that's that's not going to be an insurmountable gap if we have a few of those. All right, thanks, Dr. Stewart. Bruce? I guess I guess it's hard to figure out what questions to ask. Some of them are operational, and some of them are the function of how it's going to work, and some of them how we got here. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming there was some series of meetings where you discussed some of these intricacies and stuff. And probably to get here should have been at some of those meetings. but. Um, <clears throat> it seems like there's a huge randomness to these surveys, even to quantify what the difference is. If people are moving around trying to catch more fish, lots of areas when you, those, those stations typically when you're doing three a day and we're up to eight skates now, so it's a long day and you're not going to be able to travel that much farther. And they're between 10 and 13 miles apart typically, right? So to... Just to start at five when you're allowed to start and finish at eight, nine, ten. You can't beat the secretariat up too much. So then you're not going to get that much farther out off of that triangle on a typical day. And and I didn't understand the part about the three miles, but you you you're you might be able to move up on an edge or move you know, a little bit, but you'll sort, you're sort of going to be within range of that 10 miles of the other two stations to, to get your day in at a reasonable time. It seems like it's going to be hard to quantify what the difference is and what the, what the management material, the credibility of your, of your sampling data is, is be good on the stations that are on the grid. But the other ones, I heard, I heard Dr. Hicks say, they're estimating 20% up or, or that other fellow. Um, that's going to be really hard to, to quantify, isn't it? I mean, we're taking a, a survey here that's probably less than half of what it was a couple of years ago, and now we're taking one-third of that and really kind of randomizing it. it. You know, this whole thing, this whole association is going to be based on some, you know, some some tough sampling especially when a lot of the sampling doesn't exist at all and the sampling that the sampling that does exist is this i don't anyways your comments would be interesting well i i can give you comments on two angles there the first one is sort of the process leading up to this and i, and I realize if you haven't been 
following really closely along, it may be a bit of a shock that we're we, we're throwing out um, as many alternative approaches to the survey as we are this year. And this has really been an iterative process that began early in the summer with the commissioners. We had uh, effectively when we started to see the prices coming in as low as they were this year, uh, we realized that the the viability of of this 2024, this upcoming survey was going to be in question. Um, we were, to give you a sense, we were approximately two dollars off on the price, given that we were using the prices from 2022 compared to what we actually got in 2023, and that's that's outside of the budget window that we were planning for. Um, so the commissioners uh, in, um, directed us to come up with a large set of options as they deemed it outside the box. Basically, the easy changes and and um, and simplest to implement we'd already done to the survey and so they they directed us to come up with a, a series of um, additional what we called efficiencies that we could add to this we produced a document over the summer for the commissioners that had 28 different potential efficiencies in i believe 28 um, and they ranged from fairly small things to fairly large items from that we winnowed down to a few that we thought we could actually implement in a one-year time horizon and then the commissioners um, gave us some direction on a, a few that they liked and a few that they didn't like. Um, so, I mean, if I had to put it all in a nutshell, I'd say we didn't really want to do this process at all. But we feel like a survey with some adjustments to get us through this year is still better than having no survey at all. And so it's it's kind of a, a rough synopsis, but that's, that's where we ended up. Um, with regard to these individual the, the moving of the skipper stations, the rationale behind this particular approach was twofold. One is that we recognized, particularly as you mentioned with the eight skate days, that it would be nice to save the vessel some running time. And we realized that, you know, every every 10 on the 10 nautical mile grid, you know exactly how much running time it's going to take for the day. And so we thought even at the very least, if the third station of the day or the fourth station of the day could be somewhere in between the stations you've already done, it would at least save you an hour or two running time during the day. So that might make might make the survey slightly more appealing for, for bidding, knowing that you didn't have quite as much running time. So that was that was one of the goals. The second goal was with regard to the catch rates. And it's not just that we were counting on uh, skippers to be able to increase their catch rates on this skipper's choice station, but what it was also the potential to not fish stations in the design that have consistently low catch rates. I mean, you guys that have done the survey a few times know that we've got some stations that just never catch a whole lot of fish. We need to sample those periodically because we need to know what's there and we need to be able to monitor that. Uh, but for a, a one on a one year basis, it seemed like a reasonable efficiency to skip those stations, substitute something that might be more similar to the, the better stations around it. Um, and so we, it's not only improving the top, but it's pulling up the bottom as well. Yeah. But again, we, we see this as a short term solution. It's not something we would want to continue over the long term. And hopefully by next year or at least the year after, we'll be in a better position in terms of funding where we won't have to keep doing this. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. Um, I'm curious. I don't see any hands up, but does anybody online have any questions so far? Okay, John, go ahead. So, Ian, I listened to your presentation a couple of times, and I, I struggled, as always, to, to keep up. Um, but I'm looking at slide 17. I think this is yours. I got a bunch of stuff here. But it's stock, it says stock distribution all sizes. And there are two things that you noted there. One is that area two has the highest observed, and area three a or three rather has the lowest observed and it doesn't give a percentage for area four a or four four other than four b but it looks like it's 22 percent i always thought that for the bering sea was sort of the nursery ground for all this stuff and i was i guess i i look at the graph and i see that you know 20 years ago we were only about 12 percent and now we're 22 so we've actually grown there um, but the question I wanted to ask you when I heard this was, what's this all mean? I mean, why is that fish moving 
I mean, it looks like we're moving fish into the Bering Sea um, and we're moving fish out of the Gulf. And, and, and something else I'm thinking about in all this is the fish that we see in all these areas is very small, except for two, we see two sea fish, which is the biggest stuff we see by, by a long stretch. And I'm just kind of, I'm just, what's that all mean? Please tell me. So uh, two things going on here. One is that this is all sizes of fish that we measure with the fishery independence set line survey. So we're really only getting a good index of fish that are certainly above 26 inches and, and phasing in between 26 and, and legal size. So you're right, there are a lot of small halibut, a lot of halibut under 26 inches in the Bering Sea, and those are not being counted in these estimates. We don't have a comprehensive way to sample their abundance across the whole coast. And so this is, we say all sizes, but what we really mean here is all sizes that we're sampling with the fishery independent set line survey with 16 on circle hooks. So you're right. There is a mismatch between the true abundance and the abundance as we measure it in terms of those, particularly those small fish in the Bering Sea. The second piece is that it's not necessarily movement of fish among these regions. There's a number of different factors that can lead to the stock distribution. So you can imagine a case where we've there's more recruitment occurring in one area and those fish are growing up there and largely staying there, we could have a shift in stock distribution just because more fish are recruiting to one area or another, one region or another. Um, in addition, their movement is, is playing a role here. We, as we understand it from the pit tagging study in the early 2000s, there's a pretty strong net migration from west to east. And so all other things, if, if you turned off the recruitment pipeline, you would expect the stock to slowly shift toward the east, because as those fish get older over their lifetime, they're moving from west to east. And, and we, we may actually be seeing a little bit of that now. So that, that's two factors. The third factor, you, you mentioned the size of fish in region two. We also see better size at age in region two than we do particularly in region three, but really than anywhere on the coast. And so for the same number of fish recruiting, you're gonna end up with more biomass in region two on average because those fish are larger for their age. So each each fish per capita is gonna be producing more biomass. Um, and then the third component is that there's potentially a, a fishing aspect to this as well. So if you look at the, well, you guys don't have it in front of you, I'm sorry. In the figure that you were referring to, um, region two is currently at its highest uh, proportion of the stock at 26%. But the early part of that time period from the early 90s through the early 2000s, it was down at maybe two thirds that level. It was around 15%, say, up until the early 2000s. And then it increased pretty consistently from about 2005 to around 2013 or so. And that corresponds with a time of substantial reductions in the catch limits on the east side of the stock. So in 2006, when we made the transition from closed area assessments to a coastwide assessment, largely because we believe we were overestimating the biomass on the east side of the stock. We've effectively reduced the fishing intensity on the east side. And so that's another reason why we might see increased biomass on the east side of the stock relative to the historical period. So there's really four, those all four of those factors are contributing to the stock distribution. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Stewart. Anybody else have any questions? Go ahead, Heather. Um, so given the, what you've just said, Ian, do you think it's justified to change the harvest rate um, in 4CDE or in Area 4 altogether from 0.75 to 1? We've had that discussion before, and the, the commission has declined to do that. Um, I think NIMS uh, troll survey shows it's like a 14% increase in biomass in the Eastern Bering Sea. Um, just, a, just a thought. I think I'll leave that to Dr. Hicks because he's done a bunch of work on this topic. Um, but I, I guess I would note from a biological perspective that the harvest rate is a more of a management choice than a, a biological consideration within reason. But it is, excuse me, but it is based on biology. No, or based on data 
It is, but as Dr. Hicks, I think, will be able to elaborate on, it's it's really um, the choice of an appropriate harvest rate is with regard to the objectives. So conservation objectives are part of that, but there are fishery objectives in there as well. So those would all be factoring into the relative performance of one harvest rate or over, over another. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. Anyone else? Nicole. Thanks. I just had a quick one on the, you presented on the, at least a general relationship between the PDO and, and recruitment. And, and so is that, are we able yet to use any of that in the stock assessment or if not in the stock assessment in the risk table? I wasn't sure, you know, in lots of different management bodies, we're presenting this information kind of on the side, trying to understand these relationships, but I didn't know if that step had been able to be crossed here where it's actually part of the risk table. Yeah, thanks for that question. In, in fact, we do use the, the correlation with the PDO in two of the four stock assessment models. So the two long time series models where we have multiple PDO regimes, we can inside the stock assessment model, we can actually estimate the strength of that correlation. And we can use that so that effectively the stock recruit function in the inside the assessment model changes with the PDO regime. And we do that in two of the models. The other two models, because they're short time series, don't really have enough resolution in the data. We, we really only have two solid regimes to, to estimate in those models. But yes, so we are including that explicitly. With regard to the projections, um, for better or worse, we don't need it in the projections because we're only projecting three years in advance. Those fish are already in the water. And so we're not counting on completely unobserved recruitments in the future. If we were to do longer term projections, or Alan can speak to the MSE simulations there, we actually do need the PDO. Um, and, and we use that in the, in the MSE as well. I have a quick follow-up to that. Yes, go ahead. Thanks. And then does that mean that on an annual basis, you look at, at, you know, positive versus negative PDO and that can, that's what comes into effect in the stock assessment, or do you need to see kind of a duration of a positive PDO in order to say there would be a notable effect that we should include? Unfortunately, I can't guarantee a notable effect, even with a long duration, just because of all the changes in the ecosystem. But the way we, we treat the PDO is as a binary regime. So it's either high or low. Um, we have we actually earlier in um, 2023, we spent a considerable amount of time investigating multiple different ways to use the PDO as a predictor of recruitment using annual values, using running averages instead of regimes. Um, using using the PDO to predict only the extreme recruitments and not the small ones. Um, and we couldn't do any better than just just regimes. It's 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 a it's a clear correlation, but it doesn't predict individual year class as well at all. Thank you, Nicole. Dr. Stewart. Any other questions for Dr. Stewart? I have one. I'm gonna put you on the hot seat here for real quick. This is a pretty simplistic question um but if you took out the politics of our decision basis here in the economics would you care to hazard a guess at what harvest level we should be at to feel comfortable with a rebuilding of the stock well i'm not sure you can take the politics out of hell but <laughs> uh, what i will say is that um we the, the stock conditions right now are at a, in a at a point where um we have young year classes in the stock and not very many of them and we're counting on maturity and we're counting on growth of these fish and although it is true that we can't necessarily put halibut in the bank fish that aren't caught right now are probably going to be available for the next several years given that their the age structure is fairly young so there isn't necessarily, bi biologically speaking, there's not a large cost to delaying harvest on these year classes. They're going to continue to grow, and their their current growth rates are going to be exceeding the mortality rates in the in the near future. Um, you know, all all socioeconomic and political considerations aside, the 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 caveat for halibut is saving fish in a particular region or IPHC area in a particular year doesn't mean they're going to be available in that area in the next year. And that's really the hard part. Those fish may or may not be 
in that area. Um, so a reduced harvest in a, in a particular area could lead to more harvest opportunity in that area or in a different area in the future. Yeah, they have tails, they move around. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. Go ahead, Carl. Just if you could maybe comment to, I feel like we've been fairly conservative in the past, you know, I'd say decade on, on harvesting fish, but we're saying we're, you know, we, we have some leeway on what we can take out or we shouldn't necessarily take, you know, a cut per se this year is kind of what I'm reading into it. But at the same time, the biomass itself is at its lowest level. So I, I just can't quite, you know, make that, you know, add that up to, to equal something. Because to me, I'd want to be a little bit more conservative to give, that, grow that stock so we can get it back to a larger resource rather than just continuously to harvest in this, you know, 30 odd million pounds, mid 30 million pounds a year. Yeah, I can comment on that. So there's, there's, there's two components. There's the natural variability occurring on the stock and there's the effect of fishing. And we, since 2011, so in the last 12 years, 13 years, we have effectively reduced the effect of fishing on the stock. We've pulled back and we've allowed the stock to be at a higher biomass today than it would have been had we continued to fish like we were around 2011. But the flip side of that is the hand that we've been dealt in terms of recruitment and weighted age has been pretty poor. The productivity is low by any standard compared to what we saw in the previous several decades. So even though we've backed off on the harvest, uh, we've ended up in a situation at, at the lowest biomass we've seen because of the natural dynamics of the stock. So it's, 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 we, we, I think we all kind of wish that fishing were the major driver because that's the one we can tr control. But in fact, the biggest factors since the late 1990s have actually been change in recruitment and change in size and age. Heather. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Stewart, um, some of the stakeholders have been talking about just what Carl was talking about and what you've been saying in that being conservative is great, but if being conservative doesn't result in any larger biomass that will then contribute in the future, then why are we being conservative? And I guess if you start thinking about that, you ask yourself, um, the natural recruitment, the conditions that bolster recruitment are perhaps more important than the number of fish out there in any age class that can then reproduce and get bigger and so on. So I'm assuming there's a reproductive threshold that is talked about or being considered that if you're not conservative, say people are saying, oh, you know, let's just keep going for a couple of years as we have been um, and not get more conservative because getting more conservative doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna have more fish in the future. I, I keep imagining that there is a point below which you do not want to go in terms of each year class so that they don't reproduce effectively if the conditions are good for them to do so. Do you see my, do you understand my question? Is, can you talk about that a little bit? I can. The, the short answer is we don't know what that threshold is and that's a good thing because it means we haven't crossed it. <laughs> um, but the flip side of that is we don't know what that threshold is to be to be sure. Um, there's another consideration there as well, which we try to bring in through the stock distribution, which is that we do want to maintain not only enough spawners to produce that recruitment should the conditions become favorable, but we want them to be distributed across the whole geographic range of the stock because we don't necessarily know where that good recruitment is going to come from. So we want to make sure that we still have a, a healthy spawning stock in each of the biological regions such that when the opportunity presents itself, we have fish there spawning and ready to make good on the, the good environmental conditions. Beyond that, I, you know, I don't have anything else to offer other than, you know, we, we, we don't believe we've been below that point where we're seeing compromised recruitment. Um, and, and again, you know, that, that's a good thing, uh, but it, it could be there. Thank you. Bruce and then Peggy. Thank you. 
I was trying to, oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Bruce. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Bruce. Um, you, you brought up an, kind of an interesting point there. I didn't, I, I, when you were talking about the maintaining a strong spawning biomass through the whole geographical areas there. It, what, what's the history of the recruitment events? Is there, we, we always so got, have the impression that the, the, the recruitment comes from up north and this, you know, and it comes kind of drift south, but what, it, what is the history? Is that accurate or, or is the anecdotal information meet the, that match the science? Yeah, we do. We, as we understand it, the bulk of Pacific halibut recruitment occurs, say, from Kodiak Island west and into the Bering Sea. We've done just in the last few years, we've done some oceanographic modeling showing that even spawning that's occurring in the Gulf can actually produce settling recruits in the Bering Sea so that the, the current patterns go west and can actually draw those fish through the Aleutians and into the Bering Sea along the countercurrent on the, the north side of the Aleutian Peninsula. Um, so we do understand that the bulk of recruitment occurs in those areas. The challenge we have is that we don't really know good recruitments until we see them down the road and those fish have had up to seven or eight years to move around. So to be fair, we don't really know where those fish were born. We're working on some genetic tools now to try to be able to identify the, where those fish were actually spawned and where they settled, uh, but we don't really have that information. What I can tell you from the 87 year class, because it was so prominent, it appears that it, it recruited off, all over a very broad range of the stock. And as, as some of you will recall, it produced biomass in the Western areas, particularly 3B, 4A, some of those Western areas that we haven't seen since. There were very high biomass levels and those were, a lot of that was associated with the 87 year class. And then since then, we don't seem to be seeing that uh, high level of, of biomass in the West. We seem to be seeing these younger year classes moving around more, showing up even on the east side of the stock um, as, as they enter the fishery. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. Peggy? Well, I was trying to find the, the uh, chart and I can't quite find it, but you'll remember it, I'm sure. In 3A, the catch per unit effort was significantly better this year than it was last year. Last year it dropped quite a bit and we cut the TCEY there significantly. And my question is, was the cutting of the TCEY um, in general the reason that it improved in 3A this year? Um. I don't think I don't I don't think we had an improvement in 3A this year. Uh, 3A was down in the 032 FIS trend as well as in the commercial. Five percent for the, the 032. Last year was 18. Yeah, certainly wasn't as bad as the drop. Yeah, the bad the drop from last year. Um, no, the short answer is I don't think that we could probably attribute the change in trend necessarily to harvest. I think it's probably being driven as much by the, the distribution of the 2012 year class, uh, movement of those fish and growth of those fish as anything else. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dr. Stewart. So I wanted to kind of wind back to um, the actual numbers and um, sort of thinking about it as what this group's got to deal with. And <clears throat> if we're looking ahead and say there is another five to seven years of low recruitment, would it not be better to be fairly conservative now and <clears throat> take a small cut rather than in three to four years, all of a sudden we realize that we have reduced the stock a little increment every year. And all of a sudden that little increment is actually quite a bit lower because we've managed to keep a steady quota for the next few years. Wouldn't it be better to take a little bit every year right now, go down 
even if it's 5%. And even if we hold that for three years, that it adds up to a, I'm just thinking of it as a bank account, you know, you just can't take that principle. And I'm just looking for guidance for, for us. Well, I certainly can't tell you what would be better in the, in the case of the halibut fishery, because there's so many factors at play. Um, but I, I can't, I think that you're, your general summary is correct in that if we don't see another recruitment coming soon, we are likely to have roughly this level of productivity. And so the question is, is, is it preferable to spread that out over a number of years in a fairly consistent manner or hold it at a higher level? And then, as you, as you mentioned, likely take a larger reduction at some point in the future. The 2016 to 18 year classes We'll be getting a look at those over the next one to three years, one to four years, depending. Um, and so, you know, certainly you'd be able to update that information. Um, but we don't, we just don't know whether those are going to be large enough to appreciably change the trend of the stock or whether those will just be enough to keep us at this roughly the same level. But I think uh, overall your, your summary is correct. There, there is a trade off here between stabilizing the yield given the recruitments that are in the water. Uh, versus the potential for taking a larger cut in the future if, if we don't see another recruitment. Just on an addition to that, um, there has been some really strong recruitment in sable fish in 14 to 18 year, year classes. Do you, or are you familiar that there could be any correlation between the two stocks and their spawning is similar? They, they definitely, there's some habitat overlap between the two. Um, and I, I think, you know, we've all been kind of optimistic that maybe the warm water in the Gulf that produced those big recruitments for sablefish might have a positive effect on Pacific halibut. Unfortunately, the 2014 year class doesn't look that great for halibut. And that's the only one we really have to compare about right now. Um, there are some, some important biological differences between the two species. Sablefish recruit to inshore areas to some degree, but also quite quickly move offshore. So you're going to have small sable fish extending right out over the shelf where halibut are going to spend their first year and a half to two years in the near shore areas in the sandy bays and things. And then they're going to move out much more slowly than sable fish. So there are some differences in the habitat they're using and the conditions they'd be experiencing. So I can't say with any certainty that there should or shouldn't really be any similarity there. We, when we've looked at it, we've not found a strong correlation between halibut and sablefish recruitment historically, um, but that's all I can give you. Maybe that might have some help with the size of the age with having a bunch of small, tasty sablefish out there. Nicole? Thanks. And, and, and you can shut me down if I'm just not understanding this correctly, but between that, the response to that question and Heather's, I'm trying to to find the most pertinent information on on catch limits and and I thought what I heard for from Heather and and your response was like the conditions that facilitate recruitment are so much more important than small changes in the numbers of fish taken out of each year class you know by fishing that that it doesn't actually make that big of a difference and then when I was hearing long term for the stock and then what I was hearing in that response is that maybe it is the right thing to take small cuts so you're not taking a big one later and and i guess that would only remain true if you were hitting that threshold that heather tried to allude to right that you were getting to the principle as you said it so i'm trying to reconcile your responses to those two questions and if if that's not a pro if everyone else gets it i can be quiet that. but um maybe one more time on help on that And, and I think this is a good discussion to be having. And it, it is it is challenging because bo both things are sort of simultaneously true. We I don't think that by spreading out the, the harvest, per perhaps taking a lower harvest over the next few years, you're probably not increasing the chances of getting that good recruitment. What it's doing is maintaining the fishery at a more consistent level if we don't get that recruitment. So we're, we're essentially waiting to, to win the recruitment lottery. And in the meantime, while we wait, if the stock continues down at some point, 
there's going to be a change in the in the harvest even if we don't know that we've crossed a threshold i think what we saw this year and last year is that we're getting to the point where catch rates are bad enough in some places there's going to be interest in reducing that catch rate even if we know it's not going to get us more recruitment um, and so I, I think that's that's really the trade-off but it's the expectation isn't that if we take a lower catch in the next few years we would necessarily get a better recruitment we're just basically biding our time waiting for those more favorable conditions at least over the range of stock sizes we're seeing right now Sorry, just just a reminder to use the microphone. Oh, your microphone for the people online. Sorry. Okay. Any other questions for Dr. Stewart? I'll just make a comment here that um, doesn't uh, pertain to our current stock situation and your, uh, your process, but you might find it interesting. Um, I sat in on the FAC meeting, the finance meeting yesterday, listening, and I, you know, I've heard a lot of concern about where we are with, with funding the FIS and how important it is to gathering data for the resource. And I know that we have some effort out there to try and find financing to help with that situation. Um, but I was thinking that we need to be looking in multiple directions, and I and I made the comment to Com Commissioner Alverson couple of weeks ago and then uh, um, to Mr. Curlin this morning that and it's this is probably going to go over like a lead balloon but it feels like you know we need to become more efficient in that process figure out how to do it most cost effectively on the US side we the National Marine Fishery Service spends a lot of money uh, sending boats out to do black cod survey and maybe there's an opportunity for us to combine those two operations and maybe become a little more more efficient in both of them. So I have no idea where that's going to go, but Mr. Cronin was going to raise the conversation with the other commissioners. So Heather. I I want to talk about the survey as well, but I was going to wait until we have Ray up here. Um, but that's a really good idea. <laughs> Thank you. Some of the initial people I expressed it to are like throwing cabbages at me, but we'll see how that goes. Okay. Bob? Well, I would kind of be a bit nervous about doing that. Um, as Dr. Ian said, there isn't a lot of there is some collaboration between the species, but there, you know, it, it's a possible, it, it's not quite as great as it sounds, is what I'm trying to say. I'm a lot. fisherman. I, I, I see the challenges. You know, yeah, yeah. I do. Yep. But it's interesting to look at it. Okay. Um, we'll move on to Dr. Hicks's presentation. And thank you, Dr. Stewart. So again, we've uh, been through, most of us have been through presentations a couple of times. So um, we'll just open it up to questions or comments. Yeah, thanks. Heather. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Hicks. <laughs> um, you talked um, about uh, harvest policy during your presentation uh, today, I guess. Um, and I guess I'm, I haven't been following this at the MSAB very well. And so could you kind of tell us where we are in terms of having the commissioners go in that direction and the timing of something like that? I know that several of the folks we've been talking to lately have said, we need a harvest policy. You heard Brian Ritchie say that in open session today. And 
I think that's true myself. And so I'm just kind of wondering what the process is and where we are in it um, of actually getting to a harvest policy. Yeah, thanks, Heather. And um, good to be here and see everybody. Um, <clears throat> that's a really good point. I think most fisheries have a harvest policy in place or some defined way that they manage the fishery. At IPHC, there is not essentially an official document on that. So um, Dave Wilson, when he did arrive at IPHC, felt that it was important to have a harvest policy. And we started by putting together a draft interim harvest policy, and that was 2019. And that remains on our website. And if you were to look at that document on the website, it's um, incomplete. It's it's a skeleton, basically. So what we've been doing with the MSAB and the MSE process is um, has been in support of developing a harvest strategy policy and writing that document. And given everything we've learned up to this point, um, we wrote another draft um, this last year, and that's now posted as info document six um, on the on the AM100 website. Um, that's a very recent post. So you can have a look at that. It's much more complete, but there's still some incomplete sections. And so in my presentation this morning, I indicated there's still more work to do to complete that harvest strategy policy. And what we really want to do, complete that work and then have the commissioners adopt it formally. Um, so I think you can see the, the where we are in the process by looking at info document six. Um, and then in my presentation, I said, we need to have a few more things to investigate. Um, to go over with the SRB and the MSAB. Um, and I'm, we're hoping to bring a, a document to AM101 and um, for adoption as a harvest strategy policy. Peggy. Just a follow up on that. And I, the last thing on the world I want to do is muddy the waters, but I'm just hoping for some um, verification that my memory is correct. Because back in the day, a long time ago, we, in fact, when we started at MSAB, we received this presentation of a historical look at all of the harvest policies that IPHC had. And it was illustrative for us newbies on there to see the kinds of things that the staff was trying out or thought at the time was really needed. So I think I was maybe not paying attention, but when was it declared that there wasn't a harvest policy? And, and am I using that phrase not exactly correctly because um, I'm a little confused about, I thought we did have a harvest policy. Thank you. Yeah, a really good point, Peggy. And IPHC has operated with a harvest strategy for, for many, many years. I think even when it started, you know, they were using just CPUE and um, different metrics or whatever to determine catch limits. Um, and so there's always been some something in place, but it hasn't been formalized and it hasn't been in a formal document outlined. So you couldn't say like an academic couldn't go and say, oh, this is the harvest strategy policy of IPHC. And it would change suddenly as well. We had we had, um, I mean, uh, the blue line for a while and then all of a sudden we changed to a new thing and then then we suddenly changed to an spr based method and then and that was when when we adopted this sort of spr based management approach you might even remember initially the first meeting i think my first annual meeting it was called yeah we'll we'll introduce this as a handrail i think you remember that term um so it was never really like it was sort of brought in in a loose way um, and never really formalized. And what we're doing is just to look at a more formal approach to adopting the methods of managing Pacific halibut and, and making it more transparent and science-based. Thank you, Dr. Hicks. Any other questions for Dr. Hicks? Heather? So would it be appropriate for, is the commission expecting to hear comments on your um, draft, if you will, at this meeting, or are they going to talk about it at this meeting? I mean, I probably should know that, but I don't. Or are they going to wait until 101? 
I'm not sure either, to be honest. Um, and the, the draft is out there. You saw in my presentation, I, I, I made a point that it's possible to adopt an interim harvest strategy policy, sort of the method on the road to get to a formal one. But I'm not sure that the commission has the, the time or the, you know, the, the willingness at this point to, to actually review it. Um, I think if there is op opportunity for public comment, it would be um, very useful to hear that opportunity if people do read it. But recognizing that this, you know, was put as an info document quite late in the game, I imagine it's, it, it might um, just move forward as a, a sort of gray document for now and, um, and then come up at AM 101 uh, in this next year for more formal commenting. May, may I follow up, Mr. Chairman? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. So would you see the value in sort of an intersessional discussion or group of discussions amongst stakeholders in order to be prepared for the sort of big decision in <laughs> a year from now? It seems as though when the stakeholders get together, they have all kinds of good ideas but it's too late to implement them. It's too late to sort of get that message to the commissioners in a timely way. We don't know what they expect from the public in this regard. I don't know what they expect. And it's pretty important to the stakeholders. And so maybe some of the US stakeholders have been talking about having kind of an intersessional group of get togethers that talk about some of the really major aspects of it and to come prepared perhaps in next year to do real comment. I don't know if there's value in that. You know, um, we always welcome comment in our process. Um, and, and I just urge the stakeholders when they do review the harvest strategy policy that that document is well supported by the MSE and the MSAB's work. Um, it really comes out of there. And I, I believe in the beginning, it states that it's a draft document that is really reflecting the decisions the commission has already made. So it's not trying to really bring anything new forward. It's just reflecting how Pacific Halibut has and is currently managed. Um, and that's based on a lot of decisions that have occurred in the past. But we're always open to new ideas. Um, I'm not sure the MSAB is really the place to review the harvest strategy policy. The MSAB had a lot of input into it. You know, it'll just, it'll talk about objectives. It'll talk about exceptional circumstances and use results from that process to then say, this is what the commission saw. This is what they decided on. And this is um, how we move forward. Okay. Thank you, Heather, Dr. Hicks. Uh, Bob's up next. Uh, before I go there, um, just wanted to confirm that people online are able to hear what's being said in the room and uh, make sure to get your hand up if you have any questions or comments. Um, we got a couple of people watching to see, make sure that we recognize you. So thanks, Bob. Mike on. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Hicks and Heather and Peggy. Um, I sort of hear a cry for, um, and I would like to talk around that in this group, um, because on, uh, just before Dr. Ian left, you know, we were trying to poke him for advice. And I believe that the MSE is our advice or could be our advice and give us the guidance for those, for the direction to go in these, not just this state of the stock, but in all states of the stock. <clears throat> and I think what Heather's getting at is, or I know that's what she's getting at, is she wants to have, be a part or this group, these groups, not just this group, but the upstairs group as well, to be a part of the development of the MSE formally and have that as something we can use for our guidance as I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be. And so could you comment on your thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. So the um, 
probably the most effective way to be involved with the MSE process is through the MSAB, the Management Strategy Advisory Board. Um, and we have uh, members from different sectors on that board. And that's really been the, the guiding of where the MSE goes, what they investigate, what's of interest, and um, the objective setting process. The MSE has matured quite a bit in the you know, seven years, seven and a half years that I've been here. And we're, we're now at the phase where we're putting some final touches on a few things. And then before we start thinking about brand new things. So we're trying to get this harvest strategy put together and, and formalized, and then we can begin the next phase of the project. Um, so it, if, if this group would like to use the MSE as guidance, um, there are results already out there and I can direct you to things. We have things called MSE Explorer, which has all the results from all the important meetings that we've had. And, you know, I could walk through those or, you know, you can have a look at those and see what happens if we manage this way. What you do have to remember with the MSE is the MSE is really a strategic tool. It's a it's a longer term thinking type of tool. You know, what's going to happen in the next 10, 20, 30, 60, 100 years? Whereas the assessment is more of the tactical, what's happening now? What should we do now? That That's the tool for the real decision making and risk analysis now. The MSE is looking at, well, what's the risk of the stock going down over the next 30, 40 years, for example, if we harvested consistently in this manner? And then a couple of things coming from the results is the MSE does reflect that uncertainty and variable variability we see in the halibut stock and harvesting at a, um, say, a SPR 43%, which is our reference fishing intensity right now, there is a pretty consider, I, I don't know exactly what it is, I can't recall, but there's a considerable probability or chance that the TCY would be less than 35 million pounds. And in some cases that TCY goes to 20 million pounds. Um, and I, and I know that the stock status as Dr. Stewart presented yesterday, and then I discussed this morning, that stock status is at 42% or something like that. So it, it's not like the stock relative to what it would be if it was not fished. It's not in a bad place. It's just the biomass is low. And if it was unfished, the biomass would also be low. And in that case, that's when, um, you know, the TCY begins to drop. But in the, um, in the management we have now, the, the reference points we're using right now in the SPR 43% says, oh, you could take it a little bit lower. Um, and that's why I discussed maybe we're missing an objective here, something that's more related to catch rates or something like that. There seems to be concerns, even though all the objectives say we're doing fine. So a little bit long winded, winded way to say I'm willing to help you interpret some MSC results. The MSAB is a great way to be involved. Um, and um, that, you know, we if, if you do want to be involved in guiding that process in the future, um, let me or any of the secretariat know. To follow up slightly, sorry. Um, I guess I'm I'm interested in it because um, I'm uh, involved in the Canadian sable fish um, management, and um, we our our group like this recommended quite a few years ago that we actually use the MSC to actually make the make our um, TACs for the year and um, so we've they, they took it a step further and I sort of see it you're working on good stuff but I don't see it usable in the same way that we use it in the CS in the Canadian sablefish assessment and um, I sort of hear a cry for it you know and because you know everyone keeps bringing you like as you say long-winded because there's this and that and the other but we could take a lot of those results and take the windedness out of it do you do you agree 
I, I do agree. And it's the MSE was really originally developed in fisheries to do exactly that, to develop a management procedure that was simply followed. And so these meetings would take 15 minutes. You'd say, here's the data, here's the mortality limits. Okay, let's go home. Um, but the commission has not wanted to um, give up that flexibility and that decision-making process. Um, and so I think the SRB's recommendation of splitting out the distribution is to help get to that and maybe make a more formal procedure for determining the coastwide limit. But as we see now, the MSE work and the, the suggestions of the MSE work and what the commission has adopted for fishing intensities is suggesting TCYs around 48 million pounds. I think it's this year. It's up in the high 40s. And there's a lot of reservations against that, um, it seems. People are not willing to harvest that many fish given the size of the spawning biomass. So that's part of the iterative nature of the MSE is you learn things, and then you got to backtrack a little bit and make sure you implement those. And so I think we're in that phase right now. The commission doesn't want to give up that flexibility, but we're moving towards that. Hopefully it's just moving towards it a little slower than the sable fish did. Thank you, Bob, um, Heather, and then Carl. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hicks. Thank you, Bob. I think what we are faced with is a lot more uncertainty every year. And I think the stakeholders are anyway. And I think what I'm hearing from stakeholders, I've been hanging out with you know, people who are upstairs <laughs> in the conference board, and they've been talking about how the more uncertainty there is, the less direction we're getting as stakeholders. And we don't have a blue line anymore. We don't have a handrail anymore. And it's been progressively less, it's been progressively more difficult to figure out what the advice really is from the staff. And that is particularly true this year, I think. And so I think people are reacting to that. And I think they're looking towards a harvest policy potential as kind of a guideline because the stakeholders, they know what they need to stay in business. And we're hearing a lot of that, particularly from the sports guys on the American side saying, if we don't get this number, we're not gonna have a business anymore. And we're gonna lose, you know, a million dollars a season in Homer or a million dollars a season in Kodiak or wherever. And so I think the stakeholders are struggling, you know, the fishermen especially to determine what level we can responsibly end up at. And I don't think they're finding the guidance that they once did in the material that they're getting from the staff. And that's not a criticism, it's just a, a state of being, I think. And I think people are hoping that a harvest policy could help with that. If I may comment. Yeah, I, I think I think it's a really good point and the, the staff does not provide specific advice of catch limits, of a specific catch limit. Instead, the staff is now providing the decision table as the tactical decision-making tool for this year. And so I would encourage everyone to look at that decision table and look at the risks in that decision table. You'll see the reference level, and that's the SPR 43%, TCY 47 million pounds, showing the risk of the spawning bound mass declining. And then now there's other options in there um, and so it's it's more of a decision making tool rather than specific advice. And and we've we've done that to really separate the management and the science and the staff wanted to be more focused on the, the science rather than the decision. Thank you, Heather, Carl and then John. I think it's just more so of a comment, um, just going back to a couple um, little reference you made a, a few minutes ago. I think it's just like we're saying that we're we can kind of stay at the status quo and, and but that missing piece i think at least for me is you know, even with the surveys this year i was surprised at the the data i thought it was going to be worse just given see or sorry seeing what our guys how long it took them to fish you know in order to catch out you know it, it took longer for guys especially in canada like <clears throat> normally a guy can block out you know in two trips and they were going out for four and still leaving fish in the water and it wasn't just that at one particular time, it was kind of spread out through the season. So I think that's just where the disconnect is for me with the information that's being presented this year. 
I agree. And I think that disconnect is there for us as well. We're, we're you know, that's a big difference between the FIS and the, um, the commercial fisheries. And, you know, that's where we need to look to stakeholders and processors and to try to understand why that difference is there. All right. Thanks, Carl. John? Well, so Heather, to your point, I, I've, I've heard the same, I heard the same stuff in the meeting Monday night. I've heard it since then. You know, people are looking for ha our harvest policy. I guess what I'd say, though, is I don't feel like, based on what I've seen here, what I've heard from the scientists, I feel like I can make a decision. I mean, it, it seems it seems clear to me. Um, it'd be great to have a harvest policy. We've had lots of policies in the past. They all work until everybody doesn't like them. Oh, that's <laughs> not the number. And so I don't disagree that we shouldn't have a harvest policy. I just think. Again, I can look at this data and I'm, I'm not I'm not the scientist. I'm not the guy, but I can look in for my own mind, for my own satisfaction. I can make a decision about what I think we need to do. Um, and I do think that what I've heard the last 36 hours is the same stuff I've heard almost every meeting I've been here. Um, and that's just people like what they hear until they don't and they want more. And and suddenly this doesn't work. This har harvest policy screwed up. And I think my sense is any harvest policy we have is not a state document. That is, it's going to be adjusted as as things change. I mean, that's my sense. Um, I guess, um, again, let's have a harvest policy. Let's do it. Let's get it done. Let these stakeholders who are talking about the last 36 hours that I've heard, let's get them together somehow and 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 create a body that puts this together. I thought really that's what the MSAB was going to do. But um, anyway, I just, uh, again, people like harvest policy till they don't. And, and then suddenly it's no good. And we got to change it. Because we don't like the number. Because we're getting cut. The fact is the resource is in, in trouble. I mean, it's been there for a while. And until, as, 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 as Dr. Stewart and Dr. Hicks have said, we need recruitment. I mean, that's what we need. We need a recruitment event. We need 2022, 2012 to be much stronger than they think. And we need 16 and whatever it is, 17 to come on hard as well. And the fascinating thing about recruitment is you don't have a clue when it's coming. I mean, this is true for almost every species I'm involved in. Pink salmon, you could have a very small uh, uh, spawn deposition and get a huge ret return. Happened this year in Southeast. Anyway. Well, I just make the comment that uh, I think that the real challenge for the commission, I've been coming to these things for a long time off and on too, and hearing a lot of the same information. And I think the real challenge is that people come, you know, uh, to the meeting with short term economic situations in the at forefront of their mind. And we have, we're managing a very slow reacting resource. It takes a long time for things to change. And so, there's, it, it's pretty challenging to uh, to make that association. Every, you know, everybody comes here and, and hopes to make immediate effects, and it's not going to happen. So, any other questions for Dr. Hicks? Uh, I really appreciate the work that staff is doing, and I'm, I was I was encouraged today, listening, or I guess it was yesterday's presentation about the um, the. Um, you know the use of the AI. Although I'm an AI skeptic, the, the fact that there's a lot of a lot of things changing in science that's allowing you to obtain information faster and faster, and that's that's really going to help, when, especially when we're talking about a slow-growing resource. So, thank you. Okay, uh, everybody okay? Do anybody need a break or anything? Okay, yep, take a 10 minute break, thanks.
<laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, the next thing on the agenda is to uh, put Dr. Webster on the hot seat and see who have some questions. Thank you for being here, Dr. Webster. We appreciate it. No problem. Any questions? Peggy. Forgive me, Ray, but I just have to ask, are you having any trouble with Corvids with that hat on? <laughs> uh, no, not here. Good, good. Have you here. That it's a good question. Thank you. <laughs> um, for anyone who's not aware, last, at our last annual meeting, I went for a morning run and a crow stole the hat I was wearing off, off my head. Yeah. So this hat was actually bought a year ago in Victoria to replace the hat that was stolen. So has not happened yet in um, Anchorage, though I did see a moose this morning on the trail. So didn't steal anything. I found out yesterday that stocking caps are a pretty handy thing in Anchorage. I went for a little walk and my ears got pretty chilly. So. It's great. Um, Dr. Webster, you were in the room, so I think you probably heard my comments about uh, the FIS um, earlier as far as uh, the financial aspect and the potential combination of uh, with NIMS and their Black Cod survey. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Sorry, could you repeat the question? If you have any, if you have any thoughts, any input on my uh, idea about combining the um, the FIS, at least on the U.S. side, with National Marine Fisheries and the Black Cod Survey? Thank you. Um, so we did do this in, so you mean com running them as a single combined survey or using the data from the the um, um, Sable Fish Survey? Well, I was speaking specifically to cost efficiency and, and combining them. So they do, they have different purposes and they have different um, um, target um, depths and areas. Um, so from what I understand, from what we use, so I'm not as familiar as some people might be with the Sablefish survey, but we did use some of the data from that survey um, prior to our survey expansion into deep waters when we didn't have our own data in waters between 275 and 400 fathoms. And we stopped using their data um, after that, once we had our own data, which turned out not to necessarily tell the same story that the Sablefish survey was was telling, but they're they're they're, they're very different surveys in how they're designed. They're running long transects um, perpendicular to the the depth contours. Um, they they cover depths that we don't cover, and probably vice versa as well. Um, so I'm I'm. And um, the gear configuration is also different. So we're targeting different species. We do catch they will fish, they do catch halibut. I'm I'm not sure. I, I I I'm not sure how I would we would go about designing a combined survey that was successful in targeting both of those species as well as the current surveys um, do. And that's all I can say. It would be challenging for sure. I, you know, got a lot of fishing experience, and, and most boats out there carry both types of gear on the boat at the same time. Uh, and uh, but you know, room, how many people you have to have on board, uh, travel time. I just you know, it it may not, it may be a terrible idea, but um, you know, both of those vessels are out there cruising around the ocean. If you could narrow that down into uh, half of the amount of time that was spent on the ocean uh, by numbers of vessels that, you know, you could, you could get a lot more efficient pretty quickly if you could make it happen. I appreciate the idea. It's the first time I've heard this being proposed. And so it's always um, good to get some new out of the box ideas. So certainly discuss this with my colleagues to see what they think. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. Well, Norm, sorry I was negative about it because I actually like doing stuff like that. My fish halibut and black god together. But I just thought I'd um, put the one challenge is what happens if the halibut eat all the black cod? <laughs> the black cod survey wouldn't look too good then. I think that might already be happening without, <laughs> without this. Yeah, the size of age is definitely... 
should go up in the halibut with this new recruitment of black cod. I know that the current sablefish survey has a lot of issues with whale depredation as well, which we don't have. So that's a um, another issue that might complicate trying to combine the surveys if that had an impact on us as well. The survey vessels might not be having it, but the um, halibut fishermen are certainly having whale depredation issues. Okay. Looking around for anybody else that has any questions for Dr. Webster. Heather, go ahead. Hi, thanks. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Webster. Um, this might be a tall order, but the revenue neutral um, model for doing surveys doesn't seem to be working very well right now for a number of reasons that everybody in this room is aware of. Um, Earlier, I think it was Kerland who mentioned that the commissioners might be looking at doing something other than a revenue neutral model. Um, could you kind of discuss the history of that a little bit and talk about, again, I don't want to put you on the spot, but how do you feel about that? <laughs> Wouldn't it be better <laughs> if you could do surveys without having to think about it being revenue neutral? It would give us more options, right? Um, yes. Uh I, I would like to do the survey that we that the science tells us that we should be doing, which is sampling all areas and sampling areas at a certain frequency and a certain number of stations. And um, you're correct that we're not a, under the revenue neutral target um, and it's long-term revenue neutrality. It doesn't mean it has to be revenue neutral this year or next year, but average out. And that's how it's worked in the past when, when um, prices were perhaps better, but catch rates were certainly better. Um, it averaged out um, okay. Um, but we want to be able to do the survey that we need. And um, under the current um, uh, funding mechanism, that's not possible. So if there is supplementary funding that was discussed this morning and that's available, of course, commission staff are all, all for it. Um, and um, especially in these leaner times, these, as I think Dr. Stewart has mentioned, when the stock is at its lowest, this isn't the time you want to be cutting back the information that that um, that informs your understanding of, of the status of the stock. Um, and and but that's the time when it's most difficult to to um, for the survey under a revenue neutral neutral um, funding model. So I am supportive of the, anything the commissioner commission can do to um, secure additional funding and perhaps um, have that as a stable source of, um, of funding going forwards to, to ensure the viability of the survey, whatever the status or level of the stock. Go ahead, Heather. Thank you. Um, I'm glad you said that because I was going to try to pull that out of you if you hadn't. <laughs> it seems like we're sort of glancing against the sort of, you know, uh, threshold of scariness there in terms of the size of the biomass. And um, I'd like to know more about how close we are and, and where um, on a very regular basis. And you just said that, I think. So thank you. Yes, we agree with you, I think, okay. scientists. Thank you. It's John and then Mark. Dr. Webster, help me here. When, when there's a survey done, um, does the vessel keep everything that it catches and sell it? Um, no, it's a it's a share profit share um, between the the commission and the and the vessel. So we, because I, this is how the survey has been funded through the sales of fish. So I, I believe I can't remember the exact split. Is it ten percent? That's what I thought. Yeah. So we keep. Okay. So the boat gets uh, some kind of fee for the survey itself and then gets to keep 10% of the fish. They, they bid on the survey. The, the, um, and so you, know, you, you had a sense of the the net cost of some of these areas from the table this morning. Um, and um, yeah, then they get a proportion of the fish. So I think yeah. I saw this morning too, there was a million and a half dollars that was spent on surveys by the IPHC. Is that Was that the right number? The, I can't remember, um, was this at the financial meeting? There were the million and a half that 
we mentioned during my presentation was um, the um, um, projection estimate of uh, supplementary funding that might be needed to cover the surveys that designs that um, um, that were presented um, this morning. John, could you please use your mic? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I thought I had it on. I sounded really good to me. <laughs> um, I guess I guess what I was trying to get to was I thought I thought the surveys actually produced money for the IPHC. It sounds like though they don't, they actually cost and they cost a significant sum. And so I guess my question then is if that's the case, how does how do you go about what has to happen so you can get to a net zero for survey cost? Right. So um, a little bit of history perhaps that the survey has been running successfully with ups and downs um, for a number of years until recently using this funding model um, where the sales of fish would, would pay for um, the survey averaged over a number of years. Sometimes we had reserves that we could carry over to the following year. If we had more expensive um, parts of the survey or that, um, that uh, costs went up, we had higher bids one year, we could, we could use some of that money. Other years we'd, we'd have a deficit and, and that would be, uh, sorry, other years we'd make a profit and we'd keep some of that money for subsequent years. Um, and, but, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second. Um, so, but we, the goal was still revenue neutrality. We, we weren't allowed to keep accumulating, accumulating profits. We couldn't just keep fishing extra stations in order to make more money and, and, and um, then use that money elsewhere for the, for the IPHC. The survey money, as I understood it, is, is the survey money. It's for the survey. Um, it wasn't how the, the commission itself was funded. Now, um, so the designs would be such that to, we would preserve that revenue neutrality. The, the number of skates that would be fished each year and each area would vary. Um, if we needed to, if we believe we needed some additional um, funding in a particular year to cover the costs, we might increase it from six to seven skates, for example, in an area. Or um, in more recent years, um, where we're sampling a subset of stations in the core of the stock, we would increase the number of stations in those areas that we think um, we projected to be revenue positive. And so that worked okay until the last year or two when, um, when I was particularly last year, prices this year, sorry, no, last year, it is 24. Um, last year when prices went down and the stock um, was stable or, or going down slightly as well. Um, and so it's only recently that that model has, has, has broken down in that we don't have, um, we're not getting the revenue from as wide a part of the stock to cover the parts of the stock that would, would be, um, um, revenue negative. So you saw the revenue positive survey included half of 2B and uh, and all of 2C and one area and 3A and that was it. Um, th there was no room for adding stations anywhere else because everyone else was projected to lose money. So I'm not sure if that that gets a, some background that might help with, with that. But That's helpful. It's, uh, I don't know what the word is, maybe it's irony, but that that this is this is information that the industry needs to make good decisions and somehow we're not getting it. It's just crazy. I thought the survey supported itself, but it sounds like it hasn't recently. And so clearly, at least from my perspective, that's something that has to be rectified because this is, this is, this is how we drive the, the, the fishery itself with this data. I think you, you, you get a wide agreement on that from everyone we've spoken to from the commission to themselves to the um secretariat staff um we want a robust survey and if that means um and i think commissioners understand this if, if that means that um, additional funding or just uh, or different methods of, of um securing funds for the survey are um, considered then that's what we need to do
you know, the fisheries are, or the fish is facing the same challenges that the rest of industry is facing. They got a trifecta of fish being harder to catch, the cost of catching those fish keeps going up and the value of the product's going down. Maybe not as significantly, but it's uh, making it more challenging. So I have Mark and then Susan and then Bill and then Peggy. Dr. Webster, just one issue. I remember when we set up the auction 20 some odd years ago, because Icicle was taking all of your fish, selling it, and then we came up with the idea of having an auction like we used to do in Bob Elverson's office in the 90s um, with the boats and transferred it over to that. One of the things that we had back then was a heck of a lot more people interested in buying the fish. Um, that seems to be, to me, um, sort of a major concern now because with the consolidation that's going on, there are not as many people bidding. Also, I used to get a lot of crap from people like Charles over there because we would always bid more. We would bid higher than we're paying the boats at the dock knowing that that money was for the purpose of going and furthering the science and making it better for everybody to fish. Uh, I, I don't know how many times we've had that discussion, but um, is that a concern now that there's not as many people that will bid for the fish in certain areas? I'm sorry, I'm joined here by my colleague, Kayla Wallace, who can answer that better. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Um, I wouldn't, I would say the, there are a lack of buyers in certain ports, but unfortunately that's um, a lack of buyers due to just like there's no other processor in that given port. And previously we'd have an independent buyer that would be competing. And for example, in 2023, we had one buyer that generally was bidding and winning several sales in the year in my recent past that in 2023 didn't bid on any sales. Um, and that certainly presented um, lack of competition in certain ports. For example, like King Cove, Sandpoint, where there's one processing facility. Previously, we would have at least had that one independent buyer bidding as well to, to provide some sort of competition. And in 2023, we didn't provide that. They didn't, they didn't, we didn't have that. Um, in more, in larger ports, I don't think that it's necessarily a lack of buyers expressing interest. We get a sizable number of buyers that say they're interested in, you know, in Kodiak and, and in the larger ports where there's plenty of processors available. Um, either they don't bid when it comes time for the sale for whatever reason, or the bids are just considerably lower um yeah i'm not sure if there's more are they lower th from the prevailing dock price of the day that's one question yeah I yeah. yeah so oh, really? something to keep in mind so there's our procedure up currently um any but any buyer that bids on the sale is provided with information on the winning bids information as well so we say, sorry, you didn't win this sale. Um, the sale is awarded to this buyer. These are the halibut prices that we accepted for this sale. Um, whether that is just enticing to get that information, I feel like that information is probably available by other means. I don't know. Um, but at times, yeah, they're considerably lower. Well, and also part of the game was to pay ridiculous amounts of money for rockfish because you'd have a couple thousand pounds of rockfish and you, you know, you get the pricing up that way and that sort of cost averages out. But I'm, that's interesting that it's not the prevailing dock price. Occasionally. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> and the whole point of it, I think is for the industry to support Yes. You guys, you know, and everybody yeah. and, and supporting the surveys that can do because the surveys are cutting way back from what they were 20 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, and that's not helping the science at all. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Susan and Bill and then Bob. Um, my point was touched on about going in and there's only one buyer in a port and then we're asked to bid and we can't bid. We can't. So, and a lot of it, 
is the delivery date into the ports too, where it's competing against another species, the salmon, or it's a weekend, and then it's a freezer price. It's not a fresh price. So there's a lot of elements, but the going into a port where there's only one buyer doesn't do anybody. It doesn't serve you well at all to get any, getting revenue for the fish. Um, yeah, that, that that's definitely under, under, understandable, and I, I agree. However, there's a lot of logistics that have to be considered as well. We have to, um, we generally in those areas, like for example, King Cove and Sandpoint, I'll use that because that's a great example that we ran into this past year. We would, um, as I mentioned in my presentation yesterday, we announce the sale for both ports and assess the difference in price as well as the potential additional cost to the vessel to bring the, the load further away, depending on where they're fishing. Um, yeah. Bill? It's just been my experience that on when an IPHC boat comes in, a lot of times it's really old fish, 10 day old fish at sea. So it's a massive amount of ungutted codfish, ungutted rockfish. And then, you know, you, you, you might want to buy the fish really bad, but then you find out like all this extra hidden extras that come along that make it a complete deal killer. Cause you know, it's like, I've gotten stuck with some really nasty things, you know, and um. And so it's like made me very gun shy, you know, because I can buy fish that's three days old, you know. And so, like, why am I gonna buy fish that's 10 days old? It's been on the boat, it's not been treated properly, and then it's just gonna cause me troubles. So that's like a lot of the reasons why I might be more hesitant to step up to the plate, you know, if I know it's something I can do something with. But if it's 10 day old fish, that means I gotta move it tomorrow or today and you know, make it uh you know, I, I don't have any legs. You know, I can't go to Boston with it. I can't go anywhere, right? So it, it's kind of one of the issues. So is there any, like, uh, incentive to increase the quality, maybe a shorter trip, or, mm -hmm. you know, maybe poke ice the fish or maybe gut the codfish, you know, to extend the quality of it? Uh, yes, thank you. So um, we generally have an, an ideal um of uh, five days of fishing and generally any fishing trip that exceeds seven days is has to be approved by either myself or another manager in the office um i i would say that 10 days to the fresh market is certainly not a standard by any means um it's generally due to either some sort of weather or some other circumstances or or just, yeah, something along those lines. That's certainly not our standard by any means. Um, I would say that our uh, current standards and that's actually listed in our tender specifications is a trip of seven days of fishing or less um, with the five days ideal. Unfortunately, um, while we are being faced with limited vessels, there's lots of pushback on wanting to extend, get the work done faster. Um, so yes, we have bumped it up from five to seven, but something going, uh, a vessel delivering to the fresh market shouldn't be routinely by any means delivering 10 day old fish. That's absolutely not the, stand, the standard. Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, Bob and then John and then Bruce, and then we have Jesse online as well. Well, <clears throat> Kayla, you've come to the right room for this discussion, and Dr. Webb, stir. <clears throat> um, I, I think there's a, you know, a lot of things that you guys already know about, of course, and understand that different buyers are bringing up. <clears throat> but the main, you know, something that I think about as well, often because we do quite a bit of survey work for you guys, um and um and we feel about it the same way that mark that you know we're doing something for the industry when we're doing it and i think you know the conference board as well would feel the same way and it's actually something that i've thought about for quite a long time because we do work with you and we try to 
fix those logistics. Maybe they would be gutting codfish. You love cut, gutting codfish, Bruce. Don't you? And um, Bruce does a lot of the surveys. But um, what about forming a kind of a subcommittee that you guys could work with to try to increase profitability in the survey as far as from the fishermen, you know, a pool of fishermen, not just this table, but also because the, the moving around of the stations, as John mentioned earlier and has been talked and different, all kinds of stuff that is kind of stirred around a bit. But science is a restraint all the time to, you know, moving things and what have you. But all the little details, if you could instigate some of the little details that, say, fishermen and buyers could make suggestions on. So if you had some kind of committee that could help work towards a, and it could be a, an industry committee, it could help you guys and help give you some examples or guidelines. And anyhow, just a thought. Thanks, Bob. John. Kayla, I just want to clarify. Did you say that you thought that the prices you were getting at times uh, for the for the IPHC charter fish were less than the the prevailing dock prices? I, based on my research from e landings, yes, it was an, it was evident that there were sales of IPHC fish that were lower than the commercial standard in that from that same buyer in that same week. Um, yeah, okay, because at least based on what I what I know, and I think we were participants to some of your trips, uh, I don't think we paid less than what I think the going price. You you know the price at the dock is exceptionally volatile. Um, and you are also, I'm sure, aware that you know, there are a lot, you go to a place like Homer. I mean, there used to be six, eight buyers there. Every time he came in, there was somebody going crazy and it's just not there anymore. Um, anyway, I, um, the, I guess the other thing, cause I talked to you last night, you know, we had an issue with Chalky. Uh, Chalky tends to show up later in the season. That's our experience. And so if you think you're going to have an issue, especially a place like Southeast, where it's all going to go fresh, um, it's good to get that stuff in early. Uh, if you're going to go out west, I suspect if you're going to Sand Point to sell or or somewhere out west, you're going to those guys are going to freeze it and not nearly as big an issue with chalk there if you're freezing the fish. At least that's our experience. And Mark, to your comment, all you got to do is is come up with a little more and then we can do better with these guys. Uh, I think that's why it needs to be, uh, to Bob's point, an industry needs to revisit this whole thing because we need the science to improve the hell of it. Um, and that's got to be a collective deal. Um, but it's, again, it's getting smaller and smaller. As you well know, the, the, the people that are willing to participate in the buying process. So, but it, it's, that's a great idea of getting a bunch of people together just to talk about what industry can do for that and i know you don't want to have your hand out but if, if your hand's out and somebody's throwing you money that's great um th that just helps the process but it's it's changed over the years and that's why i was surprised that uh, you're getting in some cases you're getting less than what the actual dock price was all right thanks uh just a heads up that for the u.s side that um the u.s delegation there's a meeting that commissioners upstairs right at the moment. If there's anybody that would like to be excused from this and be part of that, you can do that. Bruce and then Jesse online and then Nicole. Yeah, kind of, kind of two things, maybe to answer a bit of John's concerns about this cost neutrality and a lot of people were not sure what's going on, but we, I, th I think that's they've been incrementally trying to move the charter management to increase the revenue. We've gone from 
four skates to six skates to eight skates, trying to get the fishing up. You know, 90% of the revenue goes to the commission and trying to cover more, more stations and, and, uh, trying trying everything we can to get more more money out of the, these charters you can only beat so much out of it but you know on the on the sales side it's been tough i mean last year the two lowest prices were seattle and ketchikan right does that make any sense i mean you know it doesn't take a genius to figure out what's going on there i mean we got the same two years ago we got the same price in dutch harbor that we got in ketchikan on the same day so Maybe there could be some industry participation in trying to increase this revenue or, you know, um, I mean, we're in an era where the, cr the price of fresh and frozen are closer than they have been for a long time. Right. So some of that fresh fish could, some of that fish could be frozen out West and maybe marketed differently. Logistics are higher. Anyways, I think that some of the stuff we could do to increase the cost, we could probably get more strings in if we could get the secretariat to shift, do shift work on the boat a little bit more. And we need them both up when we're hauling, but we don't need them both up when we're setting or traveling. And we've had some really great people on the boats that sleep during the day and stay up later and work with us to get more, more fishing in, in the day. But anyways, it's, um, uh, it's hard when the when you're fishing long strings to try and catch the most fish. I mean, it's also hard for a boat to run an extra day somewhere else to deliver for if you get 50 cents a pound more. I get a nickel of that and, and I got to pay my crew and pay the fuel and everything. The boat's really not incented to go go much out of their way to increase the sales of the fish, you know. But I don't know. We can keep looking at it. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. You, know, you want to speak to that, or should we go to jump to the next person? Uh, I, I, we can go to the next one. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, thanks. Jesse, and then Nicole. No microphone, Jesse. Uh, can you hear me now? Yep, we got you. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. It it got a little glitchy there for a second. Um, I just have two more of like I guess these are just statements. Um, and I, I don't want to sound over. Oh, uh, maybe perhaps I'm just like um maybe a bit uh. We're beating this horse, but I, I do, I think that Bob's comment about some stakeholder input, and maybe it's just more of a brainstorming thing of like how we can be more efficient or how we can do things better. And I think having fishermen and processors both in the room is a, is a good idea for us to understand the challenges on both sides. Um, I guess to um, some of those comments about pricing, I you know, I guess this is just a just a little bit of a criticism or just like a comment in general, but but we experienced at least once this summer where um, we were not the bidder, but we were well aware of what was going on, and uh, you know the boat was given to somebody that was like fifty cents under where we knew the other bids were going in at, um, and so we were a bit like I guess our company was a bit shocked and a little confused. I mean we weren't in a position to buy, but we were a little confused as to why. Um, the commission would go, and we understand that there's like nuances about where the boat is or, but it, to us, it seemed like, you know, in, in um, normal practice or for our fishermen, like if we had offered that much more, like they would make the trip in respectively. So um, I, I know that there's some nuances there, but that was like kind of a confusion and frustration from our company on our end and, and just, you know, in those situations, like what, why, you know, why is that happening? Um, but any, anyway, that was just my comment. All right. Thanks, Jesse. Cool. I just wanted to 
Thank you. Back up a little bit and ask if there is there a serious effort like by the commissioners or by staff to to look at the design or overhaul, overhaul the design or the policy? Like, is there something actually in the works to do that that I might have missed? I didn't get to hear all of the presentation from earlier. It just it sounds like there's concern from your end about it not being a scientifically driven survey, even in good years. I mean, even if, if you're deploying more gear in areas that are going to be more revenue positive, that's not a scientifically driven design. That That's that's a funding design. And, and that sounds like a real concern. It also seems like it's not a truly sustainable system at this point. Um, and it feels like we're just kind of washing over that and thinking we might have make some little tweaks to make this better. But there's just so many changes going on in the industry right now and that they're going to affect so many of these ports, especially the ones out west, especially the ones that you mentioned, especially the ones that aren't on the road system. And it is not leaning toward more buyers. It is leaning toward consolidation. So I just wondered if there, because I'm new, maybe I'm. it's okay to ask, is, is there a serious effort toward revamping this or are we just trying to scrape by, see if we get a little congressional funding and 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 continue on the same path. Thank you for the question. Um, going back a bit, I'm not sure, maybe I, I misstated things or, or didn't explain things clearly. The, in the past and in the present, the, the goal has been to have a scientifically driven, science driven design, but it's one that's funded by the sales of fish. So it's always been the case that we've tweaked the number of skates or um, in recent years added stations to places that are revenue neutral. A re revenue positive, and that doesn't compromise the science of design. More data is not a bad thing, um, but it it means that we've modified, adapted that design in order to, to cover the cost of the survey as a survey that's funded by the sales of fish. So it's a science-driven design, but with a secondary objective for long-term revenue neutrality. Um, we would like these science-based designs to continue, and the commissioners um, would too. Um, the concern is that at the, at the present, um, with the, the costs and the prices and um, the current level of the stock, that the funding mechanism that we've had up until this point um, is not sufficient to cover the costs of the, of the survey. So if there is a long term, and this is what the commissioners are discussing right now um, and have been for some months, um, if there's a if there's a need to get supplemental funding um, or some other mechanism of funding the survey, then that's something that, that they understand that there's a need to, to pursue that, whether it's an additional um, amount of money from Congress each year to dedicate it to the survey, that's a reasonable way of funding the survey um, and maybe more sustainable than something that's subject to the fluctuations of the, the stock as the current funding model. But that is something that everybody is working towards right now. Okay, Dr. Webster. Bob? Yeah, I just wanted to <clears throat> answer you as well, Linda. I think it is. Nicole. Nicole, sorry, Nicole. Um, uh, and speak about it because I've been doing surveys for the IPHC for probably 40 years, actually, and um, and other institutions as well. <clears throat> and um, they are scientifically sustainable and profitable, but most of it is right now, a lot of things are not profitable and that's what's going on. It's not, and it's just tougher to try and do science at the same time as make money. So there is that issue that's going on for sure. <clears throat> so while, Fishermen are still profitable. <clears throat> maybe science survey work is maybe not because it's a little, you know, you're not out there doing the best you can to go kill fish and bring in big fat ones that are worth more than little ones. So, you know, there's going to be a profitability level that's going to be lesser for doing scientific work. But normally they are sustainably profitable. And I can 
guarantee you that they will be again, even though they may not be now. But also, it wouldn't hurt to work with industry and maybe, you know, the the commission is well known for how it works with industry. Um, that's why we're here. So I think it's things like that that will help. And I can assure you I've worked with Kayla, and she is working hard towards making them profitable too. So, <clears throat> but, you know, we saw quite a reduction in the halibut market last year. I mean, not only is are the prices low, but people aren't even bothering to buy them because the buyers aren't making a profit either. So that's why you're down to places in Alaska that <clears throat> used to have half a dozen buyers and they got one now. So um, I'm a little bit familiar with Alaska, but even British Columbia, our number of buyers has reduced considerably. And, and none of them are particularly making much money either. So can't really make them want to pay more when they're really not making much. But of course, you, you, some other people may be different than me that way. I, you guys might be making more money than we are, but times are tough. Period. Thanks, Bob. Liam? Yeah, I just would I'd like to make a comment about the timing of the deliveries. I think, um, I know it's not like clockwork, but if you're on a road system, if you deliver on a Friday, uh, the plants aren't open seven days a week anymore. You cannot call people in seven days a week on a Saturday or Sunday. All, all that, all those staff members have either quit or retired now. So you need to give your staff uh, a schedule. So if the boat delivers on a Friday, you cannot distribute, say in Prince Rupert, you cannot distribute the fish till Monday, which means the customers actually don't open the boxes till Tuesday or Wednesday. So you're putting an extra four or five days on that delivery date. And I know it's not uh, easy to deliver whenever you want uh, due to weather and many, many other factors, but it's just something to keep in mind. Also, the market is so much more shallow than it's ever been. Uh, so you need to really, really know your timing, know the timing of your deliveries and, and what's coming in at that time. All right, thank you, Liam. Carl? I think just to add to Liam's case um, as well, I think size of the delivery had a factor as well to, you know, the cost of trucking out of the ports this year. You know, if you really had a load under 10,000 pounds, it really wasn't, you know, cost effective to get a truck under it with what we had to pay for trucking this year out of particularly Alaska. Yeah, go ahead, Liam. Yeah, and also uh, the unknown factor of the of what we've already discussed a little bit. When you have a boat out there and you're in communication with the skipper every day, you get a feel for exactly what the quality of the fish is going to be like. Uh, with the IPHC fish within the past year or two, seems like there's been more unknown factors on quality. And then if you're going to stack that on top of existing fish, you, you're, you're worried about the quality and the longevity of the fish on the market. Well, speaking to the quality side of it, another dynamic that we haven't talked about, and I don't know how, I'm assuming that guys on the Canadian side are facing the same challenges. It's the availability of labor and the quality of that labor. Everywhere you go in the fishing industry, trying to find deckhands with experience or work ethic gets harder and harder all the time. And uh, it's really hard to develop a quality product. I mean, you really got to be on your toes and paying attention to make that happen. And I don't see that getting better anytime soon. Go ahead, Bruce. Just, just a quick track, just, just so everybody understands how hard we are trying to pound nickels out of this thing is a, to, to make a station count, you only need 200 hooks in, right? That's only two skates a gear. So all the effort in these charters is going into revenue generating. I mean, we're there. It, that's how tough it is. You only need 200 hooks in the station counts, right? So that's the, that's how much the science needs. The rest is all going to generating revenue for the for the IPHC. Just to, if I may, um, we actually have a minimum of four skates. Um, although to, to I, I, that's correct about the 
that a state is effect a state is effective if it has a minimum um, 200 hooks, but the requirement is four skates, and that's because if we start to get fewer than four skates in the water, there's an end effect um, where the ends of the skater tend to have higher than average catch rates, and that tends to fade away as you get from four to eight skates. But four is the minimum. Thank you, Mark. Uh, one one comment also on this, and um, I think it's important to bring up the fact that the market in the United States has sort of been cut in half now. Uh, Alaska fish not getting to the East Coast because there's a plentiful Atlantic halibut going on, um, and that's going to be increasing by about 18% this year. So just as an FYI, so that that makes it a little bit more difficult as well because the big markets in New York, Boston, Florida have been cut back uh, quite a bit because the the uh, Atlantic halibut and the Atlantic halibut is is a nice product. It's larger, much larger than the Alaskan fish. So <laughs> I think that's an important point to look at too when you're looking at the market uh, of the particular fish. Bad or good, it's the reality of, of what's happening today. I guess if there was a little bright spot there, there's hope for us because those Canadian fish were almost non-existent not very long ago. And now there's a resource in their nice big fish. So that's something. And also, Mr. Chairman, they're, they're finding a lot more. They've found a lot of holes uh, off the island, off Newfoundland recently. That's why the increase is, is potentially going to go up that high. Um, and they do a very, very good job. They, they've gotten better and better. And I like seeing a fishery that's growing, not decreasing. That We don't have to worry about that fact. Any other questions for Dr. Webster? Bill. Okay. They, they, <clears throat> they can be day trips and, and, um, and trip trips. So uh, no longer than five to seven days uh, with it. But there's also different styles of fishery that won't go into here. But it's a social fishery somewhat. It's, it's a little different than what we do in the Northwest. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Dr. Webster and Kayla. I think we're uh, probably finished up with you guys here and appreciate your input. So the next thing on the agenda is uh, fishing periods. So... I, we have a couple options. I mean, we're due to break. We're scheduled to break at 5.30. It's 5 o'clock now. Um, do we feel like we're ready to go there, make some recommendations yet, or should we take that up tomorrow? Okay. We'll start the discussion. Does anybody have a um, thought they want to put forward? Yeah, go ahead, Charles. I didn't see any commission. Has anybody recommend anything? Normally they have a recommendation. I didn't hear it the last few days. No, no recommendation that I saw. John. What were, what were this year's dates? What did we do in 23? I've forgotten. Uh, yeah, December 7th. <laughs> I think it was I think it was like March 10th or something. March 10th to December 7th. The 15th is on a Friday of March, just so. Well, I think that matters for not just for processing, too, when you get the first fish in, but the 15th is a Friday. Right. Is there any consideration uh, to start post-Boston Seafood Show? They weren't going to buy them. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's the week before, eight, nine, or 10, 11, 12. 
Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, 10, 11, 12. March. John. Uh, really didn't have my up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll throw out uh, if the 15th is a Friday. Um, we'd want fish if you've opened on a Friday, you'd be back in on a Sunday, which would give you the full next week. So I would say the 15th of March through the um, we'll try this again. First of, uh, November, knowing that that's not going anywhere. I mean, if you want some dates, there are some dates. Just a second on like the start dates. I think the tides on the 15th, to 18th are favorable in March. Well, someone, someone sent me that from an earlier today so yeah i think i looked at them and i can't remember i know that they were good right at the beginning of march and then uh and then towards the middle they were down again so i know that's where the conference board's recommendation is going to be coming from is what the tides are they're going from 20 foot tides on the 15th and dropping 19 10 11 foot tides 16, 17, 18. Bob, are you fishing in the Bay of Fundy? <laughs> I'm giving you Prince Rupert. So he's from Prince Rupert. There, there's a comment from Kit online. He goes, let's go old school March 15th to November 15th. So, yeah. Anyhow, cool. but the conference board will, if there's fishermen out there, which I think there is, they won't write the 15th. But I'm just, I, that's my opinion. I'm old school. So. Uh, Whatever you guys want, I don't care. Do I? Do I care? I have a comment too. Um, it is an election year. Oh, we do have a big election, and I'm looking at it, and it looks like fifth of November. So, <clears throat> who knows what's going to happen? <laughs> who knows if we'll be able to sell fish or sell a lot of fish? But I'm just saying. <laughs> Just throwing that out That's there. A good November first might We've be better. We never wrapped it around an insure, uh, an election day. I like that. Yeah, it's a good one. I know when the emperor died in Japan, God, we couldn't sell black god for about six months. But that's quite a few years ago. Well, I think that you know we have to. Um, Get, we get some input. I mean, we're all sitting around processors and trying to figure out. I mean, my my opinion is the later, the better in the spring for us and the earlier in the fall for us. So shorten up that season. That's completely contrary to what's going on upstairs. They well, Everybody wants the season to stretch out, but we have to come up with something that, and uh, we won't vote on it today, but at least have a proposal. And then when, when everybody's sitting around the table, we can take a vote. But if you if you wanted to have the good days for the production of fish and fishing, it would be from the uh, it would be like the nineteenth. But the upstairs are going to want it earlier, and so earlier cycle. I mean, so the earlier cycle would be down around the seventh. Six, seven. That's what they'll probably want up there by the tides. Right. Okay. Thanks for that, Bob. Just a minute, John. We have, I think Kit's had his hand up online here for a bit. So let's see if we can get him on. Yeah. Hi there. Can you hear me all right? You're a little bit faint, but we can hear you. Yeah. This is Kit with e, &E Foods. And, you know, I mean, we've always proposed kind of a shortened season as processors. Uh, and it's always been extended or lengthened by either the commissioners or recommendations of the conference board. I mean, and this year, I think we've proven uh, that we don't necessarily stay open. Uh, I know e, e closed down early. I know that several, if not everybody in Seward closed down early before the end of the season, uh, limited buyers in Kodiak, um, you know, and so maybe we just go with a proposed season of March 1st to December, whatever, and and then the processors do what the processors do, and if they want to take advantage of fish, they do, but 
um, I think we proved last year, especially in the fall, that we uh, will buy fish if it makes economic sense to do so, whether that's because of employees, whether that's because of market condition, whether that's because we have our inventory. And so I, I don't know, I, maybe we just put out a big season and then we just work our seasons around it. All right, thanks, Kit. John? Well, yeah, and I think to Kit's point, it's a good point. Um, the reality is Alaskans had, a, Alaskan processors had an exceptionally difficult year. I think you will see uh, operations, plant operations um, open later and close soon, uh, close earlier. And so maybe that's the, maybe that's just March 1st through December 1st or whatever, and then just let the chips fall where they may. I, I think if we don't do that, then we should probably go, we should get out of the big tides and not that anybody's going to, I mean, there will be a few guys that fish early, but mostly there'll be just a few. And so maybe it's the 19th or the 20th, whatever that Thursday, Friday is. And, uh, and I'd still close it on the first, I'd still suggest we close it on the first of November, uh, just because that's what we think we should do. And, and yeah, let, let the conference board do whatever they want to do. I guess my comment, I, I don't know what happens in your office, but I know that when it gets up to closure time, my opening's not a big deal, but, um, you know, we have this pretty involved conversation about what's good for the plant and what and how to accommodate our fishermen. And uh, it gets pretty challenging when you start trying to hammer out a closing date. And so um, we have Kit and Jesse, I think, both online. Oh, Jesse and Nick, sorry. Okay, so Jesse, you first and then Nick, thank you. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yep, we got you. Okay, thanks. Norm, I, I think um, we're kind of in your camp. We don't necessarily close down, so um, I, I would prefer shorter. I think I echo your sentiment, like we would want to start a little bit later and close a little sooner. Um, cause we're of one of those plants that like, aren't, you know, it's a really hard decision for us to actually close down. Um, and further, I, I mean, I understand where, where Kit or John are maybe coming from, but I think the whole point of the PAB is to be here and set our own opinion about what we would like and make that pretty clear. So yes, we do have the option to shut down early if it is a longer season, but I don't necessarily think that, I think we're given the stage to give our opinion. And so we should definitely go with the dates that we think it should actually be, um, knowing that that may not be accepted and we'll deal with that on the back end. Okay. Thanks, Jesse. Nick? Yeah. So I think Kit made some very good points and I know Carl's probably shaking his head right now because me and him debate this all the time, but I think it's best for everybody to have as long of an opening as we can. So if you think about it, you know, I agree that when we're getting into the doldrums of November, you know, there's some pretty big market fatigue. But I do think that having that extra time in those <clears throat> fall months gives fishermen a lot of leeway to get fish out of the water if needed. And then on the other side, when you have a long season, so for instance, we all know typically Alaska doesn't really get, get really going until April. However, in BC, we have a pretty heavy fishery in March. So what that does is you take fish out of the market in March and you're actually smoothing the price over the course of the season. So, you know, if we take 500 to 750,000 pounds out in March in BC, that's five or 750,000 now that Alaskans aren't going when they're landing fresh fish that they're competing with. So having the longer season actually works out better for pricing for everybody because there's less competition, right? Because based on the geographical location, not everybody can be fishing from March till December. People have salmon to fish, black caught to fish, albacore tuna to fish, um, halibut to fish, of course, you know, tons and tons of different spot prawns, for instance. So there's lots of variability and lots of variation. And, um, you know, you know, Bob had some very good points about how tough this past couple of years have been. And when you look and you see Trident selling four plants in Alaska and Ocean Beauty's trying to sell or selling or has sold their uh, distribution business, 
that goes to show how tough it has been in the seafood industry. And I think anything that we can do to help ourselves and get a higher price per pound and help the fishermen and help the buyer and help the deckhands and everybody um, and to make more cost efficiencies, like that's the name of the game right now. It's, it's pretty much who can stay afloat long enough till we can get through this macroeconomic climate that's going to hopefully get better in the next, you know, this year. And then hopefully we see a nice little upward trend. But, you know, it's not going to be it's not going to be drastic overnight. You know, we're not going to be, you know, going to the bank and buying bitcoins, you know, selling halibut right now. Right. Like it's, it's going to be a, a, gra a gradual process. Um, so I, I just think that with all that said, you know, there, and there doesn't and having a long season date doesn't prevent an Alaskan plant from opening or closing when they want to. So. I think that the best flexibility for everybody and the best pricing is have a longer season date. So, you know, I think I heard the tides are March, good tides on March 9th. I'd say let's go March 9th to December 9th. And every buyer has the, you know, can shut down their plants and their operations when, when they need to. So that's what, that's what I would say. All right. Thanks, Nick. Uh, Susan, you had your hand up and then Bob. I, I do think it's better to go earlier. On the early end, I think a lot of fishermen will appreciate the effort that we have, even though they have a limited ability to sell at different locations. They want the front end. I'm not so sure about the back end and going after November, but I do think going earlier in March might be better. All right, thank you. Bob? Um, <clears throat> I think everyone's spoken very well on this. Um, especially my friend John beside me. It's not often we agree on things, so hallelujah. No, no. I, I, I do believe that the, the lenience right now in this board is makes a lot of sense. And Nick just now from Seven Seas described it very well. Um, a lot of pro reasons. And, you know, if your plant, you think that it should shut down earlier? Well, you know, you can start thinking about it in April. Eight, I mean, in August, September, and then go to your fishermen in September and go, hey, we're shutting down at the end of October. You better get out there and catch your fish or you're not going to be able to sell it to us. And we like your fish. But, you know, these are the reasons we're shutting down. Um, and vice versa on the front end i i think that makes a lot of sense i know i'm not going to leave my fish to be caught in november i'm going to have mine caught in october and so i i endorse because we know that the conference board is going to want that march to december season so why buck them let's um i think there's been a lot of positive talk here today that's what i'm trying to say we could actually take this right off our agenda right now and vote on it. We could. There's some people markedly absent that maybe we'd want to weigh in on it. I kind of feel like maybe we, this is a good stopping point and we reflect on it overnight, maybe talk to some of our fishermen upstairs and kind of get a little bit more sense about this. I think you're right. I think the longer season is is going to be the where it ends up but uh i just assume that some we come back to the table and somebody throws a motion on the floor and we vote on it tomorrow morning so you can see i'm a businessman so get the deal done and especially while the other people aren't here no <laughs> but thank you for bringing sense you're right norm i think that's maybe how i ended up being chairman <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I think we'll go ahead and adjourn at this time and um, we'll pick things back up in the morning. <laughs>